All right. I want to welcome everyone. I'm going to call gonna tonight. Call tonight. Hold on, we're going to take care of this right now. It'll be a long night if we do that. All right. I would like to call tonight's meeting of the Monroe County Council to order for Tuesday, March 12th, the most beautiful day out there in Monroe County. I want to note for our record right now in the council chamber, we have Councilor Hawk, Councilor Munson. Over here, we have got Councilor Iverson, Councilor Crossley, and I'm Trent Deckard serving as the president of the council. Um, we have no member online. Uh, we uh, will have other members joining us later, or, or uh, Councilor McKim will be joining us later, I should note. Uh, we'll now move to our agenda and that we've got, and the second item on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd ask you all to join me in that. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you very much. We have adoption of our agenda on uh, next for us, and uh, I'll ask counselors if there's anything you want to change on this agenda at all. I would note that uh, we have no ARPA requests or ARPA items, so you'll see a note on there for ARPA, but we will um, keep that on there uh, as we have done and, and table it to March 26, uh, unless I hear otherwise. I don't anticipate I will. All right. We good with the agenda, folks? All right. Awesome. We're going to now move to public comment. And so for public comment, this is for items that are not on the agenda. For members of the public, we'll invite you to either come up here in the Nat U Hill. You'll have three minutes or raise your hand on Teams and we'll get you one at a time. And so if anyone in the audience here wants to come forward, you're always welcome to do so. Here in the Nat Hill, just simply come forward. On Teams, simply raise your hand. One note I just want to make for any member of the public watching this or in the room or anything at all, you are always welcome to make a comment at this meeting. You are always welcome in this meeting. And uh, this is your courthouse for the people of Monroe County. So if there's anything that ever makes you feel like that's not the case, please reach out to one of these counselors or myself. But you are welcome in this meeting, always. And that should go without saying, but I wanted to say that. All right, seeing none, we will move on to item number five on our agenda, and that is department updates. Uh, there will be a time limit uh, of 10 minutes per department. Uh, and on the agenda, I, I'd ask uh, departments to try to keep it even under that so that we're moving on to the business and get everyone uh, to that, to have an interest this night. Do we have anyone here in the room wishing to make a department update uh, or on Teams? Raise your hand or give me a signal. I see Mr. Grass, come forward and welcome. Yeah, we're on. Well, thank you. As I said, I, I tend to talk really fast, so I'll try to cram 20 minutes into 10. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm Corey Grass. I'm, as you know, I'm the jail transition team director. I wanted to give you a quick update on the things we've been able to get done the last couple of months, two, two and a half months since I started. It's definitely not an inclusive list. Uh, I just went through and made a bunch of bullet points, and it, it's wide ranging and not in any sort of order. But um, I mean, early on, I, I, I joined a waiting list to do the uh, pony training that some of the commissioners, I think, got to do a while back. Uh, haven't had a chance to do that yet, but it should be coming up sometime in Ohio later, I believe. Okay, let's see. I met with Scott Carnegie from uh, DLZ, the architect, multiple times. Uh, we've, we've been including with him in meetings multiple times. 
uh, requested a jail transition plan from the Dubois and Franklin County Ohio Sheriff's Departments to try and help us streamline our process a little bit and learn from their, their process. We've had meetings with the Bloomington Transit to help develop an evacuation plan for the future jail in case we'd have to evacuate inmates out of there and where we would take them and how we would move them there. Uh, well, I met with a lighting vendor uh, with our uh, maintenance guy, David Gardner from the jail, it was a huge help to talk about lighting for the next jail. Uh, I met with the public defender's office to ask them about their concerns and the things that they like that we're doing now and how we can do those better in the new jail. Uh, I've had multiple meetings with Angie Purdy. Uh, she's probably tired of dealing with me uh, and also RQAW on the consultants for finishing the uh, jail feasibility study and then collected information that they wanted sent to them that they have now. Uh, I met with Jeff Grove from the Indian Department of Correction. He's a jail inspector who will be uh, helping us down the road when we do have the new jail built. Uh, I met with two separate people from the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce to hear their concerns. Uh, I coordinated a meeting with the uh, president of the NAACP. Uh, I've helped on transports in the jail, specifically transporting a female to Rockville, Indiana Women's Prison to learn about that process and how we will do that in the future. Uh, I participated in a forum at the uh, Monroe County Public Library uh, with NAACP and uh, Prosecutor Oliphant. Uh, we've had multiple meetings with Monroe County Fair Board, again, on evacuation plan and where we can house the inmates if we would have to get them out somewhere safe. Uh, I had a separate one-on-one -on -one meeting with uh, Prosecutor Oliphant to discuss the new jail's needs. Uh, I attended the Indiana Sheriff's Association Conference and met with other departments to discuss their new jails and uh, met with vendors who are in the new jail space, construction and, and processes. Uh, I've had separate meetings with counselors Wilts and Bunsen uh, to discuss their, their likes and their wants for the new jail. Uh, I attended Commissioner Gibbons IREX presentation in this chamber. I uh, participated in uh, multiple executive sessions with the council and the commissioners and others over the last few weeks. Uh, we've coordinated schedules for two months out with both myself and Scott Carnegie from DLZ and also Mike Ruiz from our transition team to try and uh, start putting together some, some tours of other facilities and do our due diligence on how places are doing things. I had President with, uh, coffee with President Decker to discuss some of the same topics. Uh, I met with a, a vendor who has a, a handheld device technology that will scan someone's fingerprints or their irises to help process people in and out of jails, uh, try and speed up that process and be more accurate. Uh, and then lastly, uh, I think it was last week, uh, we toured the Franklin County, Ohio facility. And I can circle back to that later in a lot more detail when uh, the chief and or sheriff speak later. And I noticed as, I, as uh, Councilor Hawk came in, I forgot, I was keeping bullet points and I, I forgot to add things like, we had quite a long phone call on my way to Ohio and on my way back. We've spoken a couple of times about the same topic. So uh, it's been a pretty rapid pace, luckily. Um, let's see here. Uh, I met with all the county judges uh, last week also to hear their concerns and get their feedback about the new facility. Uh, I met with uh, Deputy Prosecutor April Wilson, who's a former member of the CJRC. Uh, who's very, very into the new jail and has a lot of great ideas. Um, Mike Ruiz and I toured the Dubois County Jail, which is a relatively new jail, smaller jail, uh, but to ask about how they built their facility and the process they went through to try and streamline ours a little bit. And then I've spent quite a bit of time in our jail and our sheriff's office just talking to staff there to ask them what they like about what we're doing and how we can do things better in the future. So again, that's not an all-inclusive list, but just kind of a random sampling of the amount of uh, feedback I'm asking for and the people I'm trying to meet with. Thank you very much. Questions from counselors? Yeah, Councilor Iverson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Grass, for uh, I kind of 22 items there. So that's quite a bit. <laughs> I, I don't know if I got my numbering off or, or not, but that's, that's great. But my question for you is, that was a, quite a laundry list of things you've done. What's coming up? What can we look forward to in the next couple of weeks and months as we still don't have a site for a new facility? What are you gonna be working on? I would love to answer that if I could wait until we, we're gonna move on to something to ask about some of the transition details. And I have a, I'll turn the page here, and there's, I could probably give you 2,200 topics that came from our tour of the other facility. Uh, just it's, it's everything from, it's the programming of the space, again, with the, the architect, but also the new facility. They have covered every topic you can imagine. It was, it was a bit overwhelming even. So again, I have a couple more pages of notes I can bring up whenever we get back up for the, the second phase, Great. if you don't and, mind. And that's the Franklin County facility? Yes. yes. Great. Councillor Crossley. Sorry, my original mic isn't working. Um, so thank you, that was a lot. Um, but um, I appreciate the work that you're doing. And um, it was an enlightening uh, experience to be at the NAACP meeting um, with you and both Sheriff and um, Chief Deputy as well. Um, so thank you for all of that. And 
my question to you would be, since you were meeting with a lot of uh, people and they were providing feedback, I'm not sure if you would be comfortable in, in giving that feedback, but I just would like to know out of curiosity, was the general consensus from everybody that you've met with, um, like what's their thoughts about you know, how slow or how fast we're moving along? You know, what, what's the general idea? Because I hear a lot of things um, and, you know, people have a lot of opinions and um, but everybody should be validated. Uh, and I feel that way. So I just wanted to know, like, what was your feedback from um, just a general consensus feedback? I haven't spoken so much specifically about their feelings about you know, the timeline of how fast we're going. It's more about what we're doing now that works for their, again, specific department. Public Defender's Office has some very specific stuff. And as we talked about, all very what I thought was very logical stuff that would be, we're doing things now that we can do better in the new place with technology and or staffing or size and things. Same thing with the judges, same thing with the prosecutor's office. Um, the consensus I pick up on is everyone's excited to do something and get moving and, and get it going. Um, I, I was thinking, you're talking about building consensus and outreach. I was thinking as you were speaking, I think everybody on the, the council up here and I've either sat with, talked with, been in committees with, just in the short telephone calls, the short time I've been doing this. Um, and Councilor Munson and I discussed this too, that but that's my job is to build consensus and just at least take as many pins as I can. I, I, people often hear me say, I don't think we're gonna build a perfect jail because I don't know what that really means. Today, specifically, you, know, you and I may disagree on one topic even, let alone, multiple other people having a say in that, how we're gonna do things, and then technology changes, society changes a year from now, 10 years from now, but we can do much, much better. And I think that's kind of what I pick up from other people too, is they tend to say, you guys are doing great, but in the new place, could we, and there's a lot of questions about where it's gonna be and things like that, but most people just wanna have us address their concerns and, and the things that they live with, and that's why I'm reaching out to ask those same questions. Thank you. Other, other counselors? Over here, any questions? No. I, 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 yep. Yeah, go ahead, Counselor. I would just like for you to send those remarks to us so that we can keep them in front of us, if you can, mm -hmm. or have somebody transcribe them so that we can keep track of all of the exciting things you're doing. And um, as I said to you, and it probably wasn't what you wanted to hear, but we're not Columbus, Ohio, and we're not going to be. We're not that size. And certainly if we're not gonna allow new housing growth, we're never gonna to get to that size. Um, and many of us really don't wanna be that big. But we can't do what Columbus is doing mm -hmm. because we're never gonna have that kind of money, at least in the near future. So as I suggested, we cherry pick some of those wonderful things that, that you all have seen that the sheriff want, would like to do because as you reminded me, no matter what that building's like, if the sheriff doesn't wanna move his department there, <laughs> it's not going there. So uh, I would like very much for you to pick some of those things that you think might be within our reach and then have us work towards something that's possible instead of dreaming of something that's impossible. Sure. That's just my thought. And I think we're, we're very aware of that. I mean, there's, there's the dream Taj Mahal that you want and then what you can afford, what's realistic for your needs. And we had the same discussion with the folks over in Ohio. Right. As I same. reminded you, I've sold real estate since the 1970s. And if you show someone a million dollar house when all they can afford is a $300,000 house, they're never gonna be happy with that smaller house. So uh, let's try to put something together that we can reach that people can be happy with. Absolutely. Councilor Iverson. Yeah, I think um, Council Member Hawk raises an interesting question. The, your purview here is, is on transition and transition activities. It's not on design work or coming up with a blueprint drawing at this point. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, so as we're, as we're talking about a lot of the consensus building, which is, again, an amazing list, you know, it sounds like you're talking to all the right people, you know, we're still not at that point yet of creating those blueprints or the design elements of, of you know, of this new, a new facility. Uh, and I just wanna make sure that everyone understands that you're doing amazing work, and that's work that is adjacent to the work that we'll be doing once we start, you know, coming up with a site and the designing of that, that building. Thank you, that's, that's correct. And from the architect's perspective, and again, he is amazing, the amount of work he's done and the number of times he's done it, 
at some point we can start the programming of the space. Eventually, the, some of the generic stuff before the site's picked, but eventually we'll also have to do the specific programming of those, how it's gonna be laid out once we know where, where it will be. And the conversations that you're having is going to help in those conversations Absolutely. eventually down the road too. Got it, okay. Thank you for that clarity. Thanks. I appreciate very much you coming to give this update. And one of the things that I think we talked about was that that perfection shelf that seems to be placed out there. And, and no two people are gonna agree on what perfection actually means. But one thing that we definitely know is much better than what we have now is maybe not perfect, but much better. And I think that the collaboration that you're doing, the discussions that you're having, as well as the transparency that the sheriff, the chief deputy, jail commander yourself have in coming in here to update us on this, telling us the needs and the wants, and as, as well as the, here's what's well, not so good at times and we're fixing, I think those are honest conversations that help all of us support that effort to do that. So I'm grateful for that. An ounce of that now pays dividends later and it's worth every second of all of our attention. So I'm just grateful for this. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you so much for the update, Mr. Grass. Good to see you as always. Sheriff Marte, Chief Deputy Parker, good to see you. Good evening. I'm not going to talk as fast as Corey does. Uh, one of the things that stood out to me as I'm listening to Corey explain what he's been doing through, the, through a couple of months now, it is answering a lot of questions and putting a lot of concerns to rest. There is a lot of opinions out there and a lot of concerns because people don't know. And when people don't know, they fill those, those vacancies with, with negative thoughts. And you know, so we are right now in the process of trying to kind of, kind of put the concerns to rest to a degree. We know we're not going to please everybody. We get, we know that. We know we we, you know, we're not going to sacrifice uh, good for perfect. We have all that, and uh, so we just keep moving forward and try to answer all the questions that we can in an honest way, with a stipulation that that we will be transparent. Uh, he he so far and 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 has done continue to do a good job as far as trying to meet as many people as he can, and that's a lot. That's a lot to do. It truly is. Uh, Chief Deputy Parker is going to get more specific, but we're going to talk about the updates as far as the jail side. But what I want to do is talk about something very general, very quick, about the department in the whole. Now that I've been here over a year now with the with the executive staff, I could tell you that that um, the jail had received a lot of attention and needed it, and it still does. Uh, but at the same time, I could tell you that the, the merit deputies on the road, they do a phenomenal job. They truly do. Uh, when we are uh, shorter staff and they, they have a county, a large county to take care of, you know, our nearest support or backup is the state police. And sometimes that's just not there because a trooper could be responsible for maybe two, three counties at a time. So really we depend on our own to provide the services for the residents of this county. And they do a good job. We try to provide them with the uh, resources that they need, the equipment so they to continue to do a good job. The other thing is this, that we don't mention them uh, as often as we should, are the people that do the administrative work. They are the backbone of the department. I mean, the, the, these people do great job, uh, uh, the amount of hours that they spend, and I've learned from them throughout the year that I've been here so far and what they have done for the citizens of this, of, of this county, which is phenomenal. So with that being said, I'm gonna pass on the, the floor to Chief Deputy Parker. He will talk specifically about uh, the progress we have made in the jail and talk about phase one and phase two, what we're doing in the jail at the present time. This is the share of my program here. Okay. Um, we've kind of honed down these updates a little bit here. So we're going to go over like four or five different segments here. So first off, I want to go over the population report, which is pretty common for us um, to make sure that uh, you uh, commissioners, uh, and I'll be giving the same update tomorrow at the uh, commissioners meeting, uh, and more importantly, the public uh, know what's going on inside that facility. So right now, uh, where our jail population is sitting at 214. Uh, if you remember, oh, it been, you know, maybe a month ago, six weeks ago, we were about 275. So um, uh, again, I got I to gotta give props to the 
to the, the judges and, uh, and the prosecutor for seeing that, tending to it, and that they went to work. Um, and part of that, quite frankly, if you remember, we had those, uh, we had those days where the, the courthouse completely closed down because of lack of heat, and that, that contributed and exacerbated that problem. Judges came right back, prosecutor came right back, went to work, and, and that, that hone, got honed down pretty quick. So of that, um, that population, there are 164 uh, uh, felony violators in our facility, which is 77%. Of, of our total population. The misdemeanors are at 35, and that's 16%. So we have other holds, uh, you know, and that, that could be anywhere from a hold from DOC to a parole hold or whatever. We have 15 of those individuals, is 7% of our population. So there's your 100%. So I, I again, I, I would point out there that that, you know, that 77% of the population uh, versus 16% of the population, those are high-level offenders that, that are housed in that facility. Our secure bed count uh, right now is at 183, well below um, the issue that we have in our private settlement agreement, you know, and, and we, we strive to keep that at 215, and I think we explained that to you as we, as we have implemented different, um, a, a different system for how we house people uh, to keep it safer and and uh, more productive there, so we're 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 even well below that that self-imposed limit. We had uh, in the last 48 hours we had 21 new bookings, and we had 15 releases. So um, even with that, our population is still sitting at 14. Uh, something here I, I I think that we sometimes we don't bring to people's attention, but this is something that we do quite regularly. We've had an inmate. Um, at, a, at a hospital facility, and that uh, we're, we're at, they're there for five days. And during that time, we have to have someone there 24 seven the entire time they're there. So that pulls off, that's your jail staff that is, that is providing that security there at, the, at, at wherever that, that hospital is. So as we, as we talk about staffing things and as we go forward and, and, as, and as we start looking to this new facility, those are all things that we need to discuss. But I thought that was an inter interesting point because we rarely talk about that, that part of the, the staffing of a facility. Uh, next one I'm gonna bring up is our mental health. Um, this thing, uh, th this, this aspect of what we deal with continues to um, be problematic for us. Right now we have 45 what we, our mental health professionals have designated as severely mentally ill residents. Uh, that's, that's down from about 50 on February 1st, but it's still 20% of our population. And if you remember, as we do these updates, I've talked to you about that, and it's usually ran between 15 to 20% of the population, and uh, we're kind of on the high side of that right now. Um, and right now we have 52 inmates that are on some type of uh, psychotropic uh, medication. So the severely mentally ill is, is, is if, if when we talk about this new facility, that needs to be front and center as we talk about how we're gonna manage that into the future. Because right now it is the struggle bus, I'm, t I'm telling you, in that facility that we, we currently occupy. Um, We've talked about our mental health professionals and they do a phenomenal job in there. Um, and we've always talked about them being reactive instead of proactive. And we, we truly are, but they have reached down and they've started a, um, a group session uh, now that's called uh, uh, Dialectical Behavior Therapy. And what that is, they have about eight to 12 individuals that are in group with this and they say they're having really good results. But it's, it basically talks about, um, it's, it's based on the idea that uh, you're regulating your, your emotions and your, uh, your management is, is a learning deficit as opposed to an illness. In other words, you can learn to do that. So they're giving them skills to be able to learn to manage um, you know, their, their, uh, their emotions and their decision making. And I'm really glad to hear that we're, that's the first time that we'd be able to have a group. And uh, we're gonna be on your agenda next council meeting to talk about these, these additional positions. So I won't get into the whole lot, lot of that, but it kind of points to, to what we're trying to do there 
on the mental health side. And if you got 20% of your population, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big part of your population that you must be dealing with. Staffing report. This, uh, this will bring a smile to Peter Iverson's face because he's the one that requested this be part of our updates. Jail division, we remain fully staffed. Okay. Uh, we had, I, I want you to listen to this statistic. We've had one resignation in the past 90 days. That is, inc that's an incredible statistic in and of itself. And that person only resigned because they wanted to move back home to Northern Indiana. So um, to, to maintain fully staff and have, uh, you know, slow that resignation level or, or that attrition level out tells us we're, we're headed in the right direction. But then on the other side of that, what uh, Commander Gibbons has done, God, I hate giving him credit for things, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, <laughs> he's, got, <laughs> he's got six or seven part-time employees there, and what he does is he trains them up, equips them, gets them trained up. So when we have a, a, a resignation, we have staff already trained, already equipped, already working in the facility that step into that role so there's no downtime. So he, so what happened here, we have a full-time person leave, a part-time person comes in, fills that slot, we bring on another part-time person. So we keep that, we keep that buffer between us. And uh, you know, is very, very handy in helping us not go through these periods where we're you know, five, six, seven people down. On the merit side, we have four vacancies as of March 1. We are in the final phases of our selection process for the merit deputy side. Uh, right now, we just hired one um, tier one certified police officer. Already been to the academy. We, uh, his first day was March the 10th. I know it's on a Sunday, but that's when the pay period started. So he just came on board. And we have two additional tier one certified officers that only have one more process to go through. And if they, if they are successful in that final phase, we'll have them hired by March 31st. So that will, that will leave us with one vacancy. So we're, we're hitting on all cylinders on both sides of this equation. Um, facility update. Uh, several things to bring you up to speed on that. Uh, our, our, we've got our new dryer uh, that was delivered here on February 29th. It is installed, so that brings us up to two washers, three dryers, uh, which is huge for us because that, that, that one dryer being down slowed that process of laundry. And uh, as we're sitting here, I wanna really thank the Board of Commissioners for uh, allowing that purchase for us and making that happen for us. And then Angie and, uh, and Richard Kreider, you know, kind of helping us shepherd us through that. So uh, props to them for helping us get that, that thing rolling. Uh, we've got the new stove ordered. It has not arrived yet, but it is, it is out there uh, in the wings somewhere, but we anticipate that coming to us soon too. Um, a couple pretty exciting uh, things that are going on on uh, uh, March 5th, uh, Sheriff signed the MOU with Bloomington Transit. And what that MOU is, is that when we, if we do ever have an evacuation of the facility, Bloomington Transit has partnered with us uh, to provide that transportation to and from the location of where we're going to house those people in a temporary emergency evacuation. So I really want to thank uh, the mayor and, and uh, Mike Clark there from Bloomington Transit from, for partnering with us. And they made it very easy. So just, uh, just an example of the county and the city working together to, to do the right thing. Uh, we also signed an MOU on March 11th, the sheriff did, with uh, Murrow County Fairgrounds. We're going to start working through the process and, and that'll, that will be uh, the area that we look to should we have that need for that evacuation. So, um, you know, the, the fair board and the president, Jake Conrad there were again stepped up when we asked and were willing to take that on for us and we greatly, greatly appreciate it. Moving on. Our sanitation thing here, um, it's, uh, we're, we're, we're moving into a different phase of that. Uh, if you remember, the, the first phase of that was trying to get it under control, get it, get it where it was workable, and now we're just starting to fine tune that and make it so that it remains sanitary or longer and, and where we can clean it easier. So uh, what we've done here is um, 
We're, we're going through, we've already got the hallways and all the, uh, the intake area done where we've got more permanent um, uh, solutions on the floor so that we can mop those and clean those and, and they're, they're disinfected a lot easier. So we're moving into the, the day rooms and the individual cells now. So we've already got that done in block F. We started block D today. So what will happen is over the course of the summer, we will refurbish all of those floors so that, that our inmates uh, can, can mop those and clean them there and, and take care of their own housekeeping. And it's much, much easier to disinfect and clean um, so that the cleaner that jail is, the better things are for everybody, including, uh, I mean, you can, you can see it when they enter the new facility, like in Block F there, that it's been completely refurbished and they can keep it clean. It, it has an impact. Uh, the other thing that Kyle's done up there is he completely revised our inmate storage system. And if you get the chance to come over and see the new storage room, it's all on racks. We bought new property bags that are all tagged and property is shrink wrapped. It's put in there and it's to avoid the loss of property and so that it's easily retrievable when, um, you know, someone is ready to leave our facility. So uh, it that's, believe it or not, that's one of the biggest problems in the Three, three facilities that I've had the, the pleasure to work in, that getting that system down where that property is brought in, accounted for, logged, stored, and then back to the, back to the uh, resident whenever they leave in an efficient manner. So I uh, really, really done a nice job getting that done. Um, we're gonna do something a little different here today, and I know I'm running out of time here, but we had a, quite an update for you. Um, we, we, brought some, we brought some guests with us. We brought a couple corrections officers because we're always up here talking about things. So we, we thought that uh, we would we'd bring some, some staff here and I'm gonna turn this over to the sheriff, but I'd like for uh, our officer, uh, Cordell Perry and, and Lorelei Oakley to come up and he's gonna, he's gonna do a little talking about them. So I'm gonna step aside. When we first took over, we uh... We uh, put a lot of emphasis on the jail side and uh, what the chief just articulated, everything that we accomplished so far to this point could have not been done for people that stand before you right now. Um, we have actually uh, pushed, pushed hard and pushed fast and they stepped up. Without them, we couldn't stand in front of you and, 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 and report to you all the success that we have, all the accomplishments we can continue to make if it wasn't for people like standing in front of you right now. They, they are so dedicated that when we ask them to try to change the way they see things and the culture of, of that environment, it was challenging, it was difficult, but they stepped up and accomplished it. Uh, one of the things that we try to do now is provide a more training than possible that we can provide to them and, and listen to what their needs are because without them, we can't do our jobs. And they, they truly, truly uh, do the very best that they can, even when the elevator goes down, and that happens frequently. These are the folks that make sure that the resident there gets fed. These are the folks that make sure that they get the Medicare that they need. These are the folks that transport people to the actual hospital. These are the same folks that make sure everyone is safe in there. So they have a lot of responsibility in an environment that's very dangerous, in an environment that really is kind of small for what they accomplished for us. So I want to personally say thank you to them and to the staff because without that, we wouldn't be here right now. So thank you, gentlemen and ladies, appreciate it. And I wanna let the hands upon everybody and say thank you. And <laughs> that's all we have, thank you for now. Thank, thank you, you, Sheriff. Thank you, Chief Deputy Parker. And thank you as well to to your personnel coming over here and spending a little time with us it's good to see you in here we thank you for your service we plan on making that part of the routine here so you'll you'll see okay. those those officers is we're gonna bring we're gonna bring think, a couple with us every time i think you've got a question from counselor hot good i heard i heard you mention the elevator again and i don't know what progress is being made but i don't think we can wait for a new jail to be completed before we address that elevator. I mean, it's it's dangerous. Uh, it, it's hard on your staff. It's hard. It's just hard on everyone. So, what what can we do to help? And I know it will be up to the commissioners as well because that's the part that they do. It's not the part that the jail does. 
but it certainly affects the way that you can work and affects the way that we grow the population there, which is something we don't want to be doing. So uh, if you don't have an answer, that's fine, but please let, I want you to know that we have that on our minds. We've always got an answer. <laughs> <laughs> The, 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 the commissions are working with us, you know, to try to rectify the situation with the elevator. It's very delicate because it's just old. Uh, some of the parts are not even made. So we're trying to think outside of the box as far as, you know, what vendor do we use? How do we proceed to try to uh, uh, expedite the actual repair of that elevator? Um, so we're, we're trying to improve the way we do things there. In fact, uh, uh, the commissioners through, through Angie actually uh, purchased for us, uh, what do you, uh, uh, elevate the stairs, climbers, oh, that's, mm -hmm. that's what they are. So when we literally could, could, could use this equipment to go up the stairs and take the actual, uh, the food warmer with us through the stairs. Um, so, so we haven't received that as of yet uh, that I'm aware of, but once we do, I think that'll make it easier for us. So we think it's, you know, I saw the box about how do we proceed and business as usual if the elevator decides to go down, because it will. Um, I don't think I'm forgetting anything else on that. Yeah, One it. of the reasons why I mentioned it is I just saw on the news, was that just yesterday or day before, uh, recently, that the city has determined that, that elevator is beyond repair and they're going to replace the elevator in mm -hmm. their parking garage. And I would think <laughs> that elevator has got to be newer than the elevator in the jail. Yeah, so, and they're, they're <clears throat> having difficulty, eat, they couldn't get parts, and they're having difficulty even to get an elevator delivered. I'm just going by memory of what the article said, but it made me think, what will we do? And so I'm glad, I mean, I'm glad that you're working, trying to do a work around it. If it's not working, you've got a different way to get the food up and down and, and people up and down. So thank you. There's a, there's a couple things that I'd, I'd like to hit on with that. And as the sheriff mentioned, um, we've, we've been able to order these, uh, these they, they basically look like a, a, a pallet fork that adjusts to and will climb stairs. So you can put a 900 pound load on there and press a button and it walks up the stairs with you. Uh, so that is very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can take your food and, and things like that. You know, when we're unloading semis, and it walks up the stairs. So we anticipate delivery of those very, very soon, and Angie has been working with us on that. The second thing that we've done is we have worked with Dave and the commissioners of building an inventory of parts. So if part A fails, we have our own store, if you will, of parts that, that routinely fail. For example, we have two control boards now for that. Uh, we have some pulley wheels. We have all those things so that we've we've went through with um, with Dave Gardner there and identified, hey, what causes this problems? And we've stockpiled those parts. Here's the issue with replacing the elevator. If we if it comes to that, it comes to that. I hope it doesn't. But what we're being told here is that's about an eight week downtime. And when that occurs, we just went through a four or five day downtime and almost pushes us to the limits of, of inoperability. So looking, staring at that downtime of, of eight weeks, it's different to shut down a parking garage where people can use the stairs as best they can. Uh, and, and that's very, very problematic. So we're trying to do workarounds to make sure that we do everything possible we can so we don't get to that place where we're down for eight weeks or seven weeks or whatever. So I don't know if that helps. At, at the same time that the chief just mentioned that, if, if we have to go there, we're, we're trying to think ahead of the game as, as well because we might, we just don't know uh, if it goes down and, and it goes down completely. Um, but we're doing the very best that we can with what we have at the present time. That's one of the reasons why, you know, the essence of, of this new location is, is critical for us um, because of just that one element, you know, causes us tremendous amount of, of uh, havoc in, in that facility. Uh, because we 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 thought we think ahead of uh, ahead as far as feeding people, but as far as taking people to the courts, taking people to you know 
other locations, the hospital. That's that's we talk about stairs now. So um, we we we're pretty much trying to think from each angle as much as we can at this point. Thank you very much. We appreciate so much your time and all, all this information, which is helpful for us to do what we need to do to be supportive. We'll see you in about 30 minutes. See you in about 30 minutes. All right, other departments seeking to update, raise your hand on Teams or come forward. All right, I think we will move on. Let's move to council liaison updates and counselors. I invite you to do that. Councilor McKim. Thank you. Um, this is uh, actually really more of a, a kind of a committee update, but I guess you could call uh, committee membership uh, liaisons as well. We had a long-term financing committee meeting on March 1st, uh, which was very informative. Greg Garitas from FSG was able to attend and uh, also will be attending the next one. So I think this is really this is really what we wanted and what we envisioned for the uh, long-term finance uh, committee. Uh, there were just a, a couple of points that I think are uh, that came up at the meeting that are worth bringing up as a report. Uh, first of all, kind of the good news was that Monroe County's bond rating was upgraded by uh, Standard and Poor's from uh, AA minus to AA. So that kind of set the stage for really positive news overall uh, as far as Monroe County's finances go. The, the um, Standard and Poor's uh, raters you know, mentioned both uh, the, the strong, uh, our strong economy and also a strong AV in terms of both re residential and, and commercial properties as positives. They did mention a couple of concerns to be looking at in the future. One of the concerns was essentially the large um, in compensation, the large cost of living increase we gave this last year. Uh, I think the, the concern is that that kind of level of, of annual increase is not sustainable, which I think we all know. Um, so they, but they did, they did raise that. And then of course, annexation and the effects of uh, annexation on, uh, uh, on our particular, uh, our local income tax revenues. So those were the, kind of the, the things to be looking at uh, uh, for the future. Um, we also just dis briefly discussed the supplemental local income tax distribution. I think that'll come up, um, I can't remember, uh, is, it, is it in May that, uh, that we'll actually f have the final distribution and get that money? Undoubtedly, we're going to want to discuss as a council uh, what, how we want to handle that supplemental distribution. It appears to be substantially larger than any other su uh, supplemental lit distribution we've ever had before uh, to the tune of, for the count, for countywide, all units around $14 million. But that could mean as much as $6 million in extra uh, local income tax for the Monroe County unit. And I, you know, personally, this, this is not a result, this is not a report from the meeting, sure. but I, I think that should all go into rainy day, and I think we'll want to uh, discuss that further. Uh, we talked about concerns about the um, trust fund balance uh, for local income tax, although that's really only kind of provisional because we don't actually have the, uh, the receipts, the income until next year, until after everybody files their taxes for, for 2023. Um, we Couple, a couple other points that were raised that were uh, uh, was that uh, the general fund appears to have been balanced. You know, we know we know we made some substantial increases to the general fund. The general fund appears to have been balanced with interest income. We know that. We also know that that interest income won't um, won't last forever. Or at least the high level won't. Uh, we expect to see it continue in 2025, but uh, certainly could be reduced in 2026, particularly as the ARPA balances um, de decrease. Uh, and then finally, we were, uh, we, we've been advised that we really need to pass both uh, target fund balance for a resolution for many of our funds, and, so, and then also to, to uh, kind of uh, redo the rainy day fund uh, resolution, to establish the rainy day fund to kind of to be more specific and to update the reasons why we might want to dip into rainy day. And so we'll be discussing that, uh, those draft resolutions at the next long-term finance committee meeting, which is going to be April 26th at 10 a.m. 
FSG will also uh, will also be there. And of course, then the idea is for the committee to make recommendations uh, on these resolutions to the council. Thank you, Thank you Councilor McKim. And I, one item to note is that committee, and I'm so grateful you did the report, that committee is doing everything that it was intended to do. And it's, it, as you tick through that, it was awesome to hear. Other liaison updates? Councilor Hawk, did you have something? Um, Yes, as uh, you might know, I've spent a lot of time um, in front of that computer seeing what's going on at the state level. Um, and uh, it doesn't matter how much you follow it, they just change it all around at the last minute. And one of the things that was really scary because he was running through everything that had changed in this one bill that we'd been watching and, and put so much in there and he was talking so fast and I heard him say something about uh, the jail tax, and because it was a former um, Coit County, uh, that it wouldn't be the county council making a decision on the jail tax, it would be the income tax council, and I about fell out of my chair, and as you know, I, I right away started contacting people and saying, what's he doing, what's he talking about? Um, as it turned out, because I went ahead and went through every line of that legislation trying to find where he was talking about. He was speaking about a specific county. But why we need to watch at that is because if the state believes, unless there's some something in place because something that that county had already started and they were just going to redo it, that I haven't contacted the other county to get some feedback. But we want to make sure that it is and remains I would think we would want it to be the county council because that's the way it is now. That's how we voted on that community corrections tax. Um, now they were talking about the jail tax. And when they say that, then I think we're talking about community corrections tax, but there is also a form that the jail tax. So we, that's part of what we'll be talking about in the long range planning, no doubt. But it is also something I think we need to keep an eye on because we want to make sure there's not a movement toward may, you know, turning that over to the Income Tax Council for the decision. That would mean that the city would decide whether or not we were going to have a jail or how we were going to pay for it. So I'm, I'm just hoping that, that that will be something that will happen next year. Uh, the other thing is, I uh, saw something that uh, legislation having to do with the uh, building department, and so I contacted the building department so they could follow up on that because it would change um, some of the inspections they would do. I said, just check it out and make sure that you understand. Also, um, legislation having to do with the Youth Services Bureau. Some of it I thought might affect them. And so I got a hold of Vicki and she's gonna meet with others and get back with me and to see if there's anything we need to change on that. But there's so much going on up there um, and we'll be, hopefully, uh, those of you who are willing and have the time to go to the AIC meeting, you'll be getting an update and they'll also be doing an update online. Thank you, Councillor Hawk. I have an update, uh, Councillor Munson, go ahead. Yes, I wanna follow up on uh, what Councillor Hawk was talking about, and that is uh, the city's uh, overwhelming influence uh, for the local income tax council. And we have tried to get this changed legislatively uh, a number of years, and it's not really a partisan issue as I see it. It is simply um, a fairness issue. And there are only a small number of counties that are affected. Uh, Monroe County is one of, I think, about seven. And other counties uh, do not use the, the local income tax council dominated by the largest city membership of the, the city council. They instead use only the county council for local income tax decisions. And that's because uh, the county council represents everybody in the whole county, including the city. And this is a major concern with respect to 
um, the jail revenue that can be obtained through uh, through legislative uh, enabling. I, I'm very concerned about this. Thank you very much, Councilor Munson. I have a, an update I, I want to speak pretty frankly about tonight. Um, and I had a message that I'd forward to Michelle. Um, I, I don't know if that has gone out, but um, specifically this is a regarding rural transit and uh, the, the us having rural transit all throughout the community. Last night I spent uh, the evening in Ellsville at the Ellsville Town Council meeting and I just want to report that the changes that have been done uh, or in, interpreted at the state level of federal law regarding uh, what can and cannot be funded for ur uh, for rural transit funding for in our urban to urban areas, um, that is a change that we're all dealing with. As you all will recall, the county came together. We appropriated $86,000 towards this solution. We did that uh, in the cold of uh, last year, uh, pretty fairly early in the process. Uh, the town of Eltsville, which has received transit coverage for, um, well, probably nearly as long as I've been alive, at least 25 to 30 years, and in which rural transit is headquartered, uh, they did pay for the first three months of this year, and we have made uh, a couple repeat uh, trips over there to attempt to secure that funding for the remainder of this year. Uh, last night in the meeting, I'd hoped we'd be a little bit more successful in getting that commitment of $43,000 for the remainder of the year to maintain that service. That has not happened at this point. Um, I offer this because last night I was also joined by, uh, at the town meeting, members of the public who will be affected by this. And if there's anyone that wants to hear what that sounds like, you can go to Community Access Television, which the county also supports, and you can watch that town council meeting and you can hear from folks directly what this will be like or what it is like to receive this service or to not receive this service. And I wanna just come back to that because um, while we're talking about a, a good deal of things that are out in the future, happening in this community, this is something that could begin as early as April of this year, where someone receiving transportation assistance to uh, their doctor's appointment, to their grocery store to get what they need, to um, things that are absolutely necessary and for which they cannot drive themselves, they would no longer receive this service if nothing happens. Now, that, as I've said publicly a number of times, that is not an option. Not doing something is not an option. The county has moved on that. Uh, there is talk that the city needs to do more to long-term aid this change in the interpretation, uh, and there's a whole mess with that, and that, that is a long-term discussion that needs to happen. But for now, the town of Ellsville, um, I am hopeful that they, they're moving quickly towards a solution. Uh, one of the things that was discussed last night is they might offer uh, a one-time block grant uh, for their $43,000. They might get that from the supplemental lit distribution that Councillor McKim so eloquently discussed. Um, I've, heard, I, I, I've heard people say not to do that too. Um, but... I would argue with them, and I would do it at this mic because I have it right now, that we cannot not do something. And so, counselors, I'm going to once again call on all of you as you have risen to this occasion to articulate this as clearly as you can for these individuals, and you can watch their video. And those are the ones that could get to the meeting, that Rural Transit got them to the meeting. If they do not have those trips, it will be bad. It will not only be bad, it will be unthinkable and you can hear the description of their own voice. Um, this is a thing for which we can do and must do, and we have to do it. And I, I will offer again to the town of Ellsville, I'll do anything that I legally can do help with this, but the town must do something. They must do something. And I'm gonna add a personal note on this. My family, many of my family, reside in the town of Ellsville, and I'm always proud that I represent as an at-large member people in that border and out of that border. My family had a 
car, the impact of their garage um, in uh, uh, about a month ago. I'm not gonna get into specifics, but let's just say that the individual who drove into that garage would I believe, based on what I know from the officers there that day, be an, a, a person eligible for these services? And as I thought about this, and we're literally, if, I, if I'd breathlessly run down the street to rural transit, I could have got there in about three minutes. As I thought about their location and their proximity, I wondered if we're going away from these things, is this the future of what Monroe County looks like. And friends, I don't believe that at all because services always get better here, not worse. And so if folks think I'm being dramatic on that, just wait to see what happens if this does not happen. It will be awful. And I've said that to the town officials. And I just, again, I'd offer inaction is no action and not an option. And so I, I appreciate the indulgence of time. Any other counselors have a liaison update? Councilor Munson. It's not an update, it's a question, and it's a question uh, for you and also for our auditor. Uh, first, you, did you uh, hear from Ellettsville their, any of their discu discussion about using the supplemental LIP funds uh, mm -hmm. to help resolve this problem? There was discussion on that, that that could be a potential alternative to them, for, for them. But as I've expressed to folks, I, I want to see them take action on that yeah. because I've been kind of led down this trail a little bit before mm -hmm. and, and here we are in, in March of this year with no answer. It would be short term. Short term. It, 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 it would short -term. be short term. Short -term. Solution. And to, to also kind of speak to that, Councilor Munson, <clears throat> I, I want to offer something because a lot of times this discussion goes sideways when people say all we need is Bloomington Transit to simply give their funds uh, to, to this effort. And you know what, if that will get that done, I'm all for it. Here's the issue. When you talk to the folks at Bloomington Transit or the city, they'll say, well, the city taxpayers have paid into this fund. Why would they, they part with it? So again, what we have is a chicken and egg crisis. And what we need is a immediate solution and a long-term one too. There's, there's two issues. Yes. Yeah. So the, the question for our auditor is, um, have calculations been made as to uh, how our various local government units are going to receive uh, certain amounts from the, the supplemental lit. So based on um, last year's supplemental distribution and the amounts um, of supplemental that appears to be available for the May 1 distribution based on the um, certified distribution calculation breakdown for um, current year 2024. Um, I think um, my estimate is that Ellettsville will get around 300,000. How much? Around $300,000. Okay. So, so thank, thank you. you. I mean, that's a one-time shot of funding. It is. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Councilor Hawk. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, I'd like to make it clear to anyone listening Rural transit is available to everyone. You don't have to have a problem. You don't have to be old. You don't have to be young. You don't have to have a disability. Rural transit is available for everyone, and that is a message we need to get out because, um, and remember, I used to serve on the board, and I used to be very involved with the budgetary reasons. So there are reasons why we need to get that message out because they actually make money for every writer that they get on there. Then they get their dollars from that. So we need to make sure we're not spreading a message. Well, these are the eligible people for to be on this transit. We all are if we live in the proper area. That's number one. Number two, we all pay income taxes. Everyone who lives in this county is that pays income taxes, that money in part goes to the city for and I you know for their transportation funds. So that's part of that income tax distribution. So to say that we're not helping out, we're all helping out. And and part of the MPO when you go to the MPO and they're going through all the budgets and whatever 
they are receiving, the city is receiving credit for all of this area that they are not providing services for. So let's get down to brass tacks. Let's talk about it. And I know it's easy to talk, and I want to talk from the heart, too. That's part of my heart. You know, I grew up in Ellisville. I love Ellisville. Um, but I also know that they're making tough decisions there because they're growing at such a rapid pace. And just as Councilmember McKim is saying, we need to be putting the supplemental back and we be prepared for whatever might happen having to do with annexation. You think Ellisville doesn't want to do that as well? And then they, if they're having to choose between rural transit and maybe laying off some law enforcement or not keeping everybody uh, having the right number that go out on their fire runs. Look, they've got, you may think 40 some thousand dollars is not much. If you're working with a little city, little town budget, it's a lot harder to come up with those dollars. So I want to give them grace. I want to work with them. I don't want to go and try to find fault with the decisions that they have to make to keep the town running. Um, I don't like it when you know, the state tries to tell us what to do, and I don't expect Ellisville who wants the county to come over there and tell them what to do. And I'm just standing up for my hometown. So. Sure. Anyone else have offers? Well, I will repeat, I'll do whatever I need to do to make sure that we have service for those individuals so that they have access to that. All right. We'll move from council liaison reports to item number seven, the Youth Services Bureau. Thank you for waiting <laughs> patiently through that <laughs> important discussion. Council, I got my voice back. Um, I move to approve the Youth Services Bureau request for an update of report and structure to the education case, <laughs> education case manager job description. Second. Schmidt, thank you so much. Hi. On. Okay. Good evening, counselors. Um, first, I would like to thank Councillor Hawk for making us aware of that change in legislation. And uh, Vicki and I are working with our licensing consultant to see how those updates are going to affect how we serve our population. So I appreciate that. Um, but tonight, I am just here to request a structural change. Um, currently, uh, our education case manager reports to the clinical coordinator. We've had the job for about a year and a half now and have had a chance to evaluate what does this person actually do? Who are their tasks? Uh, mainly, you know, who are, uh, what their job responsibilities are and who they should potentially be reporting to. And so we are just asking um, to do a structural change to our organization chart to move the education case manager from underneath the clinical coordinator to underneath the program coordinator. Um, we are not asking for a reclassification or any change in job duties at this time. Very much. Questions from council? All right. Seeing no questions. We'll go to comments from the public, any comments? Raise your hand on Teams or come forward in the Nat U Hill. Okay, seeing none, we'll go to a roll call vote. You can actually do a voice vote on this since it's uh, regarding just the change of a job description. Yeah. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the same sign. Motion carries. That takes us to, thank you so much. Thank you, Councilor. That takes us to item number eight, the Board of Commissioners. Council, I move to approve the Board of Commissioners request and fund 1237-0000, restricted opioid settlement, the creation of a new account line 41004, vehicle purchase, and simultaneously approve an additional appropriation in the amount of $121,850 in the capital category. Second. Good evening and thank you for having us here tonight. Um, we're here to ask, as uh, Council Member Crosley said, for a new line to be created and for an appropriation of $121,850 $121, as a match for a vehicle. Um, yesterday, I was working with our auditor on something and came across a startling, startling statistic. Between 2012-2016, 58 counties in, in Indiana, Indiana alone, had over 100 prescriptions per 100 people in the population of that county with regard to opioids. That's startling to me. And during that same time period in Monroe County, we had an outbreak of hepatitis C. 
that went along with some of the opioid issues. And so as one of the things that we have done here in Monroe County, and we've had your support, thankfully, is to approve a syringe services program. You all are aware of the fact that we're one of only eight counties that has that syringe services program. So last year, I had the pleasure of working with colleagues in the health department, um, Kathy Hewitt, who's here with me, and also Melanie Bischlag and um, Nick Foyles of the Indiana Recovery Alliance to apply for a grant from the uh, uh, for extra opioid settlement money to um, work on some of the issues related to harm reduction and um, providing connections to care. We obtain 576000 additional dollars for this county to work on these items. And as part of that, we thought that we needed about $120,000 for a new vehicle for outreach that was based upon something that the state had actually advertised at the time as a separate grant. And so we thought, well, the state probably knows what it's doing. And it turns out that the cost would be much, much greater. So that's why we're asking for this additional money out of specifically out of the opioid settlement money. We're not asking for it out of the general fund or out of ARPA money at all. Um, and we have, if you wish, we can also provide information. It's in your packet, I believe, but also um, Auditor Gregory could talk about the fact that there is sufficient money to meet this need uh, if, as we go forward. But I also want to introduce Kathy Hewitt here, ask her to say a few words. I want to bring Melanie Verschlag and Nick Voiles up. And we also have just a little teeny slideshow for you. So, Kathy. Councilors, I just want to thank you as well as the commissioners for your continued support of the Monroe County Syringe Service Program since it opened in 2016. Your support as well as the commissioners have allowed us to provide disease prevention services and within the county. It's provided to let us help reduce harm, provide links to treatment when people are ready, and to provide OB opioid reversal medications as well as the education to make sure we saved lives. So I just wanted to thank you all very much. I'm similarly going to thank you for your support. This outreach vehicle is also, it's so impactful. I've been the primary driver of what they uh, lovingly call Larry um, uh, since 2018, and I've been out there when there is no heat. I've been out there when there is no air conditioning, um, when it is broken down because the brakes don't work. Um, we use our minivan that's been purchased by um, Health Department Grant, and Peter's been out with us before. I mean, it's it's not great, it's not private um, when you're providing services for folks that are you know, really in need of those things, um, people that are really impacted by the opioid epidemic. And um, gosh, I had something else that I was going to say, but just thank you so much. It's, it's really impactful. 50% or nearly 50% of the folks that we're seeing are through the mobile service, um, the, the mobile vehicle. So half time uh, through that mobile, mobile unit, three days a week, the other half are at the um, office. So being able to have a functional vehicle, it's really supportive of the longevity of the program, um, really impacting and meeting people where they're at. So just thank you for that. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for everything. Uh, you guys know me, I'm a local boy. I've been here my whole life. And uh, you know, some of this stuff is not uh, the most attractive thing dealing with people in marginalized situations. It's really hard, it's hard, hard work. and. Uh, to be able to get to these people where they're at and serve their needs is something that has been amazing. Uh, Larry is old, it is not gonna make it. It's gonna cost so much money to keep it to keep it updated. This allows us a way to test people that normally would not come in for testing. It allows us to reach people and make changes in their lives they would never see coming. Um, it truly is like a, a, a wonderful thing to have an outreach van and to be able to reach these people that normally traditionally are, are untradi not untraditionally housed and that desperately need this kind of uh, attention. So thank you for having us, for your continued support and for everything you've done for us so far. You have no idea what it means to me and to the community I serve. So if TSD could back up just a bit to, so we can show these slides. Um, these are things that Nick helped pr uh, prepare today. Um, so this talks about last year. Do you wanna explain some of these things? Sure. So last year, over 2,000 visits were conducted. This is about half of them through our mobile, uh, through our, um, mobile outreach. And if you look at it, they were reported, uh, over 1,500 reported overdose reversals with our, that came out of our, uh, our operation. That's over 40,000 naloxone doses provided to peers in our, in our community. 
We have set, we saturate our community. It is the reason there are so many reversals. Uh, and our, the top referrals we ever get are for hepatitis C and HIV. We, we are truly like above the bar in most communities in tackling that particular problem. Uh, that van reaching people, it, it's hard unless you've seen it. Peter, you've been out there, you guys, it's, it's something about it. When people see that you're coming to their place, that you're willing to make that mile, to make that push to them, that changes the game. It changes the situation. They may not be able to come to you, but when you come to where they're at, it truly opens up doors that are not open. Next slide. Here we have Larry. Larry is a converted food truck that we were gifted from the Chicago Recovery Alliance a long time ago. We have spent at least over 10,000 over the last year's on repairs and it costs a hundred and something dollars to fill the tank. It is not good on gas. Uh, I guess over the next three years, we projected it at at least 40,000. The leaf springs are gonna be have to be replaced. I don't know if you know what that is, but that's a huge part of the suspension that's underneath. And that thing was made in 95 when they made these huge, heavy vehicles. <clears throat> Next slide. Yep. So here we have this one. This was actually the cheapest one that we found. We looked all over. This is a mobile clinic vehicle, which allows us to do absolutely everything we could possibly do. That means the health department and I can both test. We can see people. We could have a clinical in there. We, a doctor could have a private session with somebody. It's wheelchair accessible. It's better on gas. It has a hand washing station and a private room so that people can have either counseling sessions, testing, anything. And it's a lot better on gas. It also means that for the foreseeable, you know, six to 10, 15 years, we won't need any maintenance other than oil changes or, you know, upkeep. And, and for the first time, we'll have three seats with seat belts on it, which is a wonderful thing. And as you look in there, it's wheelchair accessible. Uh, it, it truly is like a wonder for us, it's a dream. You know, we've never had anything, you know, this is gonna change everything for us. Uh, especially having wheelchair accessible. We have a couple of people that are literally unable to get on there and we have to come off to them. And it'd be really nice to get them and get their needs suited for a community that can't, or aren't as mobile. It lifts right, and puts them right up there in front of us and it is into a private room. I think that's what you had for your slideshow, but I also think one of the things that you're looking at for the van is an awning that would be over the side. So, so in the, there's a yeah, window. So, yeah, in, on that side of the thing, they're including this in the price. Uh, we opted out for the uh, package of, they wanted to put some kind of wrap on it, and we were like, we don't need that. And uh, the awning suits over so that you can have sun if it's a blustering hot day, or if it's raining, people can come up in there. You know, the way that this can be used in our community is not just this. There are other things we do in the community. We might do a food drive, we might do this or that, and it provides us the ability to do it sanitary, clean, and to get people what they need when they need it. The other part with uh, all the repairs on Larry, and that's how that vehicle is affectionately known, is it's down often enough that there are weeks that go by when they cannot do any of the outreach. And those people that we serve don't get to come in because they can't make it to our, our location, you know? And so it just means a possible spread, a possible outreach. It's, it's never a good thing for us not to have services. This is, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but nationally, we are a darling. This, this program is one of the most talked about national programs, and I speak nationally all the time. Our, the way we all work synergistically and everything, it's just a dream. So thank you for your continued support, regardless, and thank you for everything you've done for us. It truly means a lot to the people that are suffering from this and uh, to the people that we get to treat. All right, questions from council. Councilor McKim. Yes, uh, who, who will actually be the owner of the vehicle? Indiana Recovery Alliance. Yes, uh, are you organized as a 501c3? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Should we ever dissolve or something would happen, it would go to, uh, like, you know, someone adjacent to us or another 501c in Monroe County. It will not leave Monroe County. So we give it back to Chicago. No. <laughs> oh, you mean Larry? No, nothing's going back to Chicago. Yet. Oh no, I was talking about the new one. No, okay. yeah. no, no that's Monroe County's. I'm a local kid. <laughs> well, Larry Evans, send him back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Iverson. But thank you all for being here, and and it, it is really uh, impactful being on the old vehicle and being parked at various spots around town and trying to provide those services when you don't have the right uh, resources. So 
uh, this is a step in the right direction. Uh, I, I guess uh, my, my comment here is in terms of process, we knew this was a need. This has been a need uh, that has been outstanding for quite some time. time. And as we continue to do work uh, with this fund in the opioid settlement group, um, we, we have uh, been working with different partners to develop an application process such that when we don't have identified needs uh, that we know about uh, within these bodies, but the community has identified those needs, there will be now an opportunity for the community to come forward and express those needs, and we'll be able to go through the process through the auditor and, and other uh, organizations to make sure that it fits without, within the service. So thank you for bringing this here, and I just wanted to alert uh, council, I think this is the first of many that will be coming this our way. We hope. Other questions from count? Oh, did you have a comment? All right. Seeing none, uh, I think we'll go to public comment on this item. For public comment, those who are on Teams and wish to make a comment, simply raise your hand and we'll get to you, or come forward here in the Nat U Hill room. Seeing none, we will go to a roll call vote. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Hawk? No. Councillor Crossley? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Deckard? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Motion passes majority five to one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank I want to do a happy dance. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. This is a huge, yeah, yeah. We've been working on this for a long time. <laughs> Thank you very much. That'll take us now to item number B, well, not, pardon me, 8B. Council, I move to approve the Board of Commissioners request and fund 1170-0106 Public Safety Lit TSD, the creation of a new account line 47100, Equipment Law Enforcement, and simultaneously approve an additional appropriation in the amount of $287,538.01 in the capital category. Second. All right. Welcome, Ms. Purdy. Mr. Crone. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm here before you because um, apparently during our last budget session, I completely forgot about this particular expense that we have, and it's for the Sheriff's Department's um, Exxon body cameras. And um, so I'm just, I'm requesting it in addition to, let me back up a little bit, the, the amount that we're requesting is actually for two payments. Um, the entity didn't um, initially invoice us, um, as planned, and it came in the following year. So we've been about a year behind, and Mr. Cron can explain that better. So uh, what has happened is in October of 21, when the Axon Agreement was signed, that's when the first payment was supposed to be due, uh, but they were in the process of Axon, and the county was in the process of getting everything implemented. The final sign-off wasn't until February of the next year, so that's when they invoiced uh, since we didn't encumber funds over into the next year, we were actually using 22's money to pay 21's bill. And every year we just keep yes, kicking this can down the road. We're paying acts on uh, approximately four months late every year because the bill comes due in October and we have to wait till the next year's funding to pay the previous year's bill. So our request this evening is for um, 2023 and 2024. That will get us current so that we can budget for 2025 accurately. All right. Questions from council. Councilor McKim. Yes, did they, uh, did Axum charge us any kind of a penalty for the late payment? No, they have not. Axon has actually been very good about it. Um, I pointed out to them that it was due to the fact of that offset and we don't encumber funds. They've just asked that we correct that issue. <laughs> Uh, this not only affects the body cameras, but this is also the data storage that goes with the body cam video, the interrogation videos, and all that. It's all tied into the same bill. So, Thank you, and, and I appreciate that they're not charging us a, mm -hmm. a penalty for that. Other questions or comments? 
All right. Seeing none, we'll go to comments from members of the public. If you have a comment, please come forward here in the Nat U Hill or raise your hand on Teams. All right. Seeing none, we will go to a roll call vote. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Deckard? Yes. Councillor Crossley? Yes. yes. Motion passed unanimous. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we'll go to item C. Council, I move to approve the Board of Commissioners request and fund 1215-0068 election fund commissioners, the creation of, an, of two new account lines, 23001 materials and parts, 30006 contractual. Second. Um, yes, we were just requesting the creation of these particular lines, um, given that this year is a rather major election. Um, it would be more appropriate to be able to transfer some funds that we currently have within there. I think that our utilities line is a little high, um, but I think that we can then transfer within there to put for materials and parts and for some contractual work, just to keep it clean as to how we're actually expending the dollars. Right. Questions from council? Uh, yes, as a reminder, if um, it was our choice to pull that the election expenses out of county general and create uh, their own fund. And so if, if it was over in county general, we'd have to pay it. And if it's over here, we have to pay it. In other words, we have to pay it. It isn't like uh, the other funds where you're not allowed to move money around in this particular fund, it is different. It, it just works different. Um, we tried to do it one time to try to have like a rainy day set up uh, as, and then move it from there and the state said, no, no, you're doing it wrong. So uh, it's just something we have to do. Councilor Crossley. Thank you. Um, since we're talking about things related to uh, the Napa building, I remember asking this uh, during budget last year, and you mentioned since we do have a very crucial key election that's coming up, one of the biggest things that I continue to hear and I see or lack thereof and driving through that building is a lot of people, some of us really know what that building is for, but um, for you know the primary election that's about to start and people are gonna start voting here soon, um, is there any possibility of some signage that will be happening um, within maybe the primary? And if not the primary, is there definitely going to be something there for a general? I don't have an answer for that. Um, to get a sign, I'm sure we'll have to go through the city of Bloomington for mm -hmm. placement and approval. Um, and then we're most likely not going to keep that spot. Of course, right. right? Mm -hmm. um, but we could certainly put a banner on it, I would think. Um, a banner. Yeah. I think something would be, because I know the little um, folding sign usually gets knocked down by the wind or, or yeah. something or someone. And so for just for everybody to really know mm -hmm. and highlight, um, I just think that it would be really <laughs> helpful for us to have something big and temporary that's not too costly, but effective enough for everybody to really know what that building is for. Hang it from yeah. the building? Yeah. yeah. Hmm? How about hanging it from the building? Mm -hmm. That's what I was talking about, a mm -hmm. banner. A big yeah, hang with a banner the banner and just the put it right on there so it's not. Oh, that's a good point. idea. That's, that's what a I was good point. Thinking. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. Absolutely. And I apologize. I think you, I do recall you bringing this up, but okay. I totally yeah. forgot about it until right now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Other questions or comments? All right. Seeing none, uh, we'll go to public comment. If you have them, please come forward to the Nat U Hill or raise your hand on Teams. And if you see me gesture, that means I'm pointing at the screen for those walking at home. That doesn't mean really anything to you. That's just me. All right. Seeing no public comment on this item, we will go to a voice vote on this. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, the same sign. 
right. I think the eyes have carried it. We are at 631. Thank you. Thank you. I just we're, sent myself a text, so I don't look at we're, our, we're at 631. Look at our, wow. Look we're, at our exactly. time management. We're going to honor a recess to honor our time management. We will come back in 10 <laughs> minutes. Counselors, please be back on time, and we will re what, get rid of our agenda. Deal. Recess for 10. Okay. Mr. President. Right. We're going to call this meeting back from recess. And we are now at long. item number nine. It's uh, the sheriff's office. And we want to once again invite Sheriff Marte. Uh, and it looks like Chief Deputy Parker. And it looks like Mr. Grass. Come on forward here. And this is a discussion on the implementation of the transitional team. So we're back. It shouldn't okay. take too long. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to pass it on to Phil, and uh, uh, he's going to explain the, the next phase for us for the transitional team members. Um, uh, we, might, we might be behind as far as the, the scheduling that we actually need to uh, start working on. And he, but Phil will explain further. Okay, and Corey's probably going to jump in here and steer me in the right direction on a couple of things, but I'm going to deal with where we're at and what we see out in front of us and then kind of look for some guidance from you as how we proceed. But um, in, in talking with Corey and Scott, um, we are in we are in what they call the pre-design phase. And pre-design means things that you can do uh, out in front that's not site, that aren't site specific. So uh, I know we kind of touched on this a little bit in our initial conversation, but the, the site specific things are, are what Corey has been talking about, you know, going and looking and see what are the do's and what are the don'ts, what are the, what are the good things, what are the things we need to avoid, you know, what type of furniture, what, the bunk, what are the bunks gonna look like, what type of technology are we gonna want in this facility? That can all be looked at and thought about and, and get out in front of, of the site specific stuff so that when that site specific comes and it becomes really geared up, you already got that in your, in your, in your rear view mirror to a certain extent. So that's where we're at. And um, DLZ has allotted three months for that, for, the, for this particular phase. So we're already into it. Um, you know, they had uh, lots of discussion about this. So, when the pre-design phase ends, then we're gonna start really gearing up, especially when we, when we have this site selected, uh, whenever that comes. My concern is, our concern is, is that when that does come, it's simply not, okay, let's grab the transition team and bring them over and get to work. Uh, we've, we've, I think we've kind of beat this horse to death about that when we pull members from the jail, we have to be able to have staff that immediately melts in, fills those positions so that we don't lose our essential function of running a facility. So I wanna, I'm gonna be a little bit repetitive here, but I wanna move on. The transition team is not a group of new employees coming in. They're a group of current employees selected from the jail. And we simply, if, if that, happens to be six people, we hire six people, train them up, get them ready, fill in at the jail. So that's what we're here to talk to you about. So we're in that phase. Uh, I've got a memorandum that uh, DLZ put out on October 10th, and I think you've probably had this at some point. I think I even passed this out in one of our, our presentations. But it talks about the transition team, and it kind of gives bullet points of what that team actually does. And it's operational facilities, uh, maintenance, uh, inmate programming, um, then, then it goes through all these different types of things that they go through. And what he talks about is the ideal uh, team design is five to eight people. So we're kind of looking at, uh, you know, Sheriff and I and Corey have discussed, looking at starting this with, with six people and see if we, can, if we can make that work. And Corey's gonna talk about how that team, he, he had a visit and he's talked to some folks that have done this, how this team shrinks and swells and shrinks and swells. It's not always going to be um, this constant uh, transition team going to work every day and doing their business. 
So he's going to talk to you a little bit about that. But I wanted to talk about where we're in the phases, what the ideal team is, what we're asking for. And then I've got a few notes that I want to, want to talk to you about funding. And that's where I want to get your guidance. But I'd like for Corey to step in here and talk about what he found and what he has found out as it relates to transition teams, because it's important for you to hear. As I mentioned earlier, we went to uh, Franklin County, Ohio last week, a week before now. It, it took away some very specific stuff, but also some more overarching themes. They have a sign on their wall in their transition office where they all sit that says, repetition does not establish validity. And they use that to challenge themselves all the time. Anytime they kind of got in that rut of, we've always done it that way, even the guys who ran the program would get challenged on it and realize, yeah, that's, that's a bad precedent to set. So uh, we kind of went with that theme as well. I love the idea that we're going to try new things. We may, may not be able to afford all those things. It may not work for our specific community, but we at least, I feel like we need to talk about them, think about them, see what they're doing and see if we could, it would work here. Uh, they told us, uh, one of the things we took away, I should say, about their team was they're super well informed. And again, we may not be on the same scale as Columbus, Ohio, but their team was very well informed. They toured 63 facilities around the country, San Diego, Texas. I lost track of all the places. They, and they took, they sent their team there. They took the, probably the 20 best things they liked about all of them and kind of just molded them into what they wanted for their facility. Now they did shoot high on the, they were going for like a certain type of lead certification at the elite level. And they did end up going for a, um, accepting a level lower than over that. So the price was different. They were okay with that kind of stuff. So at least they talked about going for the, what, exactly what they wanted. And then they settled for what they thought they could make work for their priorities and their prices. Um, their attention to detail was amazing and their passion for what they did. They, we were there for seven hours. And at some point you do kind of start to lose the ability to focus on the minutia and every, because it's just overwhelming. And they, they told us up front that would happen because their, their passion was off the charge, uh, charts. Uh, their attention to detail, everything from the lighting, the use of colors to where their weapons lock boxes were located in the Sally port to bring people in. They walked us through all that kind of stuff. It, it was incredible. Uh, they're cogn very cognizant of the morale of both the inmates and the staff, which we find important here. We, we talk to our staff all the time about what we can do to make things better and how they're working right now. They, they gave us tons of examples, which I'll, I'll get to in a little bit, but things like they have a staff dining area uh, just to make them kind of feel like they're a team. They break bread together. They sit together. Um, and there's, there's something to be said for being on the same team and working in the same environment. They have a wellness center. Uh, again, you can go top of line with weights and things like that, but they had room for yoga. They had, they, they had really thought a lot of things through to make their staff feel included, happy, healthy, as much as they could. They talked about the use of clocks. That's one of the first things I noticed was digital clocks frequently. And they brought it up later that they asked their staff along the way, what are the things that drive you crazy in this facility? And they said, the inmates ask us nonstop about the time. We, we laughed about this today because it does happen here too. Uh, and they, they challenged that because they said, well, why would we not have clocks? It's not a casino. We're not. And they laughed and said that the only thing they could come up with back in the day, they thought inmates might be able to organize a, a breakout at a certain time if they had clocks or something. But I think we're past those days. We have televisions on nonstop. People have laptops or devices they can use in the facility. So it, it, we, the staff was thrilled that they didn't have to answer that question 500 times a day. It's something as simple as a clock. Uh, they had an amnesty box, which is once an inmate has been processed by the local police, whether it's city, county, whoever, searched and patted down, they come in. Once the staff there pats them down, there's still a room they can sit in that's kind of an open area that has an amnesty box that says, if you have any contraband or weapons on you right now, is the time to put them in this box. Because if we've missed it twice and you get inside the facility, be charged with felonies for bringing it inside. This is your last chance with no charges, drop in that box for our safety. Simple, cheap, great idea. And I think we kind of did around here, but it's, it's more word of mouth. I think if we could just have something more formalized, things like that are great. Uh, they have a bunch of free phones in the booking area. So when, it, when the inmates that are being processed want to make a phone call, they did the research and found that usually that first phone call, which traditionally, I don't know where that came from, you get one phone call, they would call somebody they love. It was the second and third phone call those people made that came and bonded the people out, never even got them in the facility. So they said, why do we not let them make more? They put a bank of phones on the wall and said, you can't call your victim or anything to get people in trouble. We monitor these calls, by the way. And if you need to make phone calls and make the phone calls while you're here. And they had television screens that showed your name and where you stood in the process, green and red boxes. You know, your, your property's been accepted, check. You've been fingerprinted, check. You're next in line. So people could always look up and think, okay, I'm almost done with this process. Uh, they, it's, it's hard to explain, but they had, it looked like blinds in the glass and their booking area was humongous, of course, but they had these, what looks like vertical blinds, these white lines, and it was actually built into the glass and it was part of a, um, I don't remember the name of the act, but it was rape prevention inside the facilities. It's a federal act. 
you have to give people privacy, but also you have to be able to keep an eye on them. And as you walk past these, oops, sorry, walk past these lines, you can't really see a person intimately, but you can see the outline that they're okay or whatever. And if you stop, you can see through the blinds. So again, what a simple use of a product that they came up with or found somewhere. They also realized by looking across the area, if you're standing still, that the male inmates can see the female inmates to those, if you're standing still to those vertical lines. So across the way, they have horizontal lines because they found the human eye can't process that. S simple things, again, the detail they went into on everything was amazing. They have oversized lockers for their staff and their wellness center. Uh, a lot of natural light everywhere, including even skylights. And again, we might not be able to afford skylights, but there's a lot of ways we can let light in the facility. Uh, they had special equipment, and I don't think it was a TTY machine. It was built into the wall, but for uh, inmates that were hard of hearing or deaf, again, was, I don't know how, what made them think of that or where they, they came across it, but a great idea. Uh, they created some areas that appeared to give the inmates more privacy during the processing. They found that a lot of female inmates were being booked in and were acting out and, and getting upset, and they did some research and thought it was because of the, some of the trauma they probably experienced in their lives. So it's a simple thing. They built some side areas that are still pretty open, but it gives the appearance of a little more privacy. And they cut down those problems substantially by just thinking those things through. Uh, they had multiple policies and procedures to encourage inmate compliance in all areas of the, the facility. Uh, I noticed even when I first, we, were having our, we had about an hour and a half meeting when we first got there, even the, the staff restrooms were amazing, uh, including, I compared to Starbucks, you know, a soap dispenser, water dispenser, and an air dryer on the same thing. Then I realized in the cell blocks, they had the same thing. Again, pretty high end, pretty top of the line, but uh, something that they had done for their facility. They had washers and dryers in some of the housing units. Again, that may be a little out of our range or our budget, but they found that the inmates had two outfits to wear usually. And they so twice a week they get washed, they'd wear the same clothes for three and four days and that was causing problems. The inmates were not happy, they were it's not smelling well. So they do the big wash in one area, but they have washing machines in some of the cell blocks that these guys can wash their clothes on more frequently. Uh, they had some netting upstairs on the mezzanine level. Um, I had a discussion with several people in my meetings about these things around here, but so that inmates can't fall off, be thrown off, uh, can't throw objects off the upper deck. And it was just a, a netting that they had done a ton of research on. They explained to us the amount of run you can do without it sagging, how many test pilots they had. It was just, it was just a great product. Uh, the staff can still see up there a clear line of sight, but people can't come over the edge, can't throw anything over the edge. Um, on the way out, they had thought about this, and I noticed at our facility, they have it set up where they noticed inmates releasing back out in the public were going in and out of the same door as the staff all day, every day, just constantly crossing paths. I see in our alley here, I will wonder, is that a staff member or is that an inmate coming out until I noticed the bags they're carrying? So they set up their new facility that inmates exit out a different way. And uh, on the way out, they have, it's called a rapid recovery center, they have a name for it, but they have resources for inmates processing out. So if you're arrested in June and you're released in uh, January, they have coats, they have all kinds of cell phone chargers, they have literature on where you can find housing or job assistance or the things that we want people to do when they get back out. Seems like a simple concept, but they built it in their plans. And a lot of the things we noticed don't really cost money or any money at all. They were doing some stuff with veterans that we don't do here. So, as, I mean, literally last week when we got back, Mike Ruiz from our team reached out to the, or the veterans organization that they, they use, and we already have an account set up and we're already using that same stuff they told us about, and it's free. It's just another way for veterans to get more resources, more access, and be better taken care of. Simple things that they thought about. Uh, they shared insight on how they picked their team. They said early on, you know, they had preconceived notions of who they wanted to work with. These guys are my friends. They know what they're doing. These are good employees. And they realized along the way, now they needed guys or gals that understood exactly what we were doing in certain areas, different backgrounds and things. So they gave us some insight on that kind of stuff. They did talk about their team expanding and contracting. Early on, it, it grew a little bigger as they had projects going on over time through attrition. Some people moved on to other projects they wanted to do and they let the team stay small at that time. When it needed to, they grew it again. So it expanded and contracted several times throughout their process. And their team was bigger than ours. I think they had 13 people currently on there and still doing it. Um, but they, they had lots of discussions on specific details of mechanisms and, and things about actual equipment, but also on policies, how they're gonna change things. And I think that was most of it. Again, they, they talked about the repetition does not establish validity, and I think that would be good for us to remember also. Everybody get everything the auctioneer just threw at you? So. <laughs> he stole that line from me. I called myself that earlier. Come on. So uh, let me, I wanted him to go through that with you so you can understand if, if and I know Pete and Cheryl, you were at the pony training. Remember they were talking about the thousands and thousands of tasks. That's just a, the tip of the iceberg. So here, here's, here's my concern. And this is where we're looking at. I've got just a few things and then I'm, and then the sheriff's going to step in here and wrap it up for us. But I told you that we're in, we're in the pre-design phase and that's, that's scheduled for three months. 
that pre-design phase essentially started March 1st that, for all intents and purposes, because that's what it is, going to these places and figuring this out. So now we're, what is today, the 12th? So we're already, by the end of this week, we're gonna be two weeks into that, that three month period. If we decided today to start backfilling these positions, the, the quickest we could get new hires in, get them hired, trained, up to speed, ready to roll so we could start pulling people out for the transition team is eight weeks. And I'm telling you, that's the fast track if we started today. So now we're two weeks in, now you add 10 weeks. So now we're already almost halfway through our, our process. So this is where I, I just want to emphasize that's where we're at and that's our timeline. So here's, here's what I would throw at you. I know we've, we've, we've talked about this. Um, we, we're we're kind of settling on six here to, to see how we can make it work. That, we don't want to start big and then have to scale down. We want to start somewhere in the middle where we know we can manage that and use those folks to, to get to the ends that we need. But I want to talk about ARPA funding and this is where maybe you're going to have to steer me off because I'm a neophyte at, this, at best. But when we brought Corey's position to the forefront, we kind of stalled until we figured out the funding mechanism. And the ARPA funds, at least from his position, didn't, didn't levy you know, local tax dollars. It, it came from, from that specific, it came from there and we could use it for that specific purpose. I think Baker and Tilly helped us with that. But what it did, it, it, for us, it quickly closed the gap between the concept of having a transition team director on staff and the ability to make it happen almost immediately once that decision was made. I think within two weeks we had the contract, Molly had helped us with that, and he started January 1st. Now, I, I'll say this with caution, but when when the ARPA funding was approved by the commissioners on November 29th, there was, there was a agreement, I guess, or some comments made that they were not in favor of using ARPA funding for any other transition team members. So from a layperson's perspective, that was a very quick means for us to have the concept, get the concept on paper, get Corey hired and get him working. So I'm asking, how do, how do we make this, how do we make this go as quickly as we can so that we can, we can get out of talking about this transition team, get these people in, get them hired so we can start shuffling people off to Corey when he needs them um, at his disposal. Yeah. That's my, that's my two cents, <laughs> Sheriff. That was one of the, 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 the issues that I wanted to make stress upon that we cannot afford to move people from a position without having people already trained to replace them. Um, we work too hard to get to where we're at now to sacrifice that. So in other words, now we're char challenged to do two things at the exact same time. And we, we frankly, we're just gonna need people to do that. Can I add one more thing if you want? Sure. Uh, and I don't think I answered Councilor Iverson's question from earlier about specific things. As he was talking about the number of people we're going to need, the, the pace is picking up on the visits of these facilities we're going to tour. We're doing it locally. We're not going around the country like, like Columbus did, but we have upcoming either currently planned or in the process of planning probably a dozen to 15 local facilities and or some that are farther away. We are uh, going to steel cell in Georgia to see the facility of where they make the doors the and then the next day they have a second company that makes the locks and things. Very common procedure to go visit those places and see what they're making. There's a furniture a manufacturer in Chicago that we're, we'll be spending an overnight there to tour their two facilities. And then outside of that, then we have plans for Hamilton County, uh, Vigo County, um, Montgomery County, Elkhart County, Jefferson County, so it's it's going to really start picking up the pace on these on the tours of either manufacturing <coughs> facilities and or current facilities that use those products and their policies. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm gonna if it's okay, we'll see what counselors think. Councilor Iverson. 
Well, first of all, thank you for this conversation. It's needed. And I think uh, the emphasis on time timing is entirely well placed. Uh, I think at the very beginning of your, your statements, you said something that was uh, pretty astute saying, we're done with planning. We spent a lot of time in this community staring around at the different research studies and talking about ways that things could be good and talking and talking and talking and talking. That's over. Uh, and, and I think that we when we ended the JFAC, uh, we made it time sensitive such that we could stop talking and get the politicians out of the way and make sure that we could start doing this work. Um, the, I, I intentionally brought the pony training booklet with me <laughs> because I need to remind myself of just how much information was jammed through our brains. And mm -hmm. I've got it turned to section number, chapter number 10, which is all about transition teams. And it makes a really good point that transition is not a, a one-time event, it's a process. And it's the only process that goes from planning all the way to post move-in. And so uh, I absolutely understand and, and, and it comports with what I heard at the pony training that we need to move now so that we're prepared. So once we start doing the design work after the pre-design phase, that we have folks in place uh, so, that, so that we can make sense of it. And, and I think the thing that I would add with what I heard in the, the training was, it's not just that we have lock manufacturers and furniture manufacturers, but it's that we have policies and procedures for training staff in a new facility so that everyone's safe. And again, I am not the person to be leading this team. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, but I just, I wanted to make that point that at least in terms of timing, the, t the time is, is right now. Um, and, and in terms of the number of, of folks, I know we've talked about this in PAC before. Um, we've, t we've looked at different things uh, together before. I, I think at, this is brand new territory for Monroe County. Uh, this is, so I, I, at least from where I'm sitting, and this is my opinion, that uh, a, a lot of the deference for expertise uh, goes to you all because you're living and working in that environment every single day and we're not. So uh, that's, that's my starting point is the timing is now and you know, the, what you need in terms of moving forward is gonna be based upon some of the expertise of what's happening inside the facility. Well put, absolutely. I, I, to, to piggyback on what you're talking about, here's, here's where we sit to cut it down in very succinct terms. If someone says, Sheriff, Phil, you can hire, you hire your six officers, get them trained up, get ready to go, we'll start tomorrow. When, when we have that transition team, we are willing to shoulder the load of what that transition team must do to produce the, the, all the work that the, the new facility is going to, to engage us with. All we need is a green light to bring those six people on board to our staff and we'll shoulder the load from there. So how, how we fund that, that's, that's up to you guys. We defer, obviously, to your expertise. I know nothing about it. But uh, I just know that our, our funding experience through the transition team director was pretty seamless when we did use the ARPA funds. Got Councillor Munson and then McKim. I want to say second what uh, Councillor Iverson said about uh, the schedule and starting is now or actually yesterday. Um, I don't know what sort of uh, position structure you're going to have for these uh, particular officers. Are they, are they within the uh, jail? Are they within the sheriff's department? How what is the structure that you're contemplating? So it, it will be from the correction officers. Okay. So in other words. <clears throat> These will be. Correction officers. Okay. Yes. Good. Yes. So in other words. So we have job descriptions yes. for those oh, yes. already. Oh, so yes, we're ready yes. to go. No, no, no. We're ready to go. Okay. We just need a funding mechanism. But as far as we're concerned, we're ready to go. And, and, and you know. March 1st has come and passed. Okay. So, so time is not on our side. Right. 
Um, I was worried, though, about the uh, job descriptions because you say they're they're going to be working part time on transition issues and part time doing well regular work. The, the, what we envision in is in the facility. Once once we once we get the green light, we need to train these folks, bring them up to speed mm -hmm. rapidly to do what we're doing now. Okay. And then the people that have the expertise bring them aboard for the transitional team because that is where we're going to actually think ahead, see in the future how we're going to have this new facility look like in the future for us. Yep. So in other words, we don't want to sacrifice what we have now. Uh, no. What we, we can't. achieve now for lack of people. Mm -hmm. Guy Councillor McKim next, and then Hawk. Um, yeah, I, I agree that uh, ARPA ARPA was great to get started. Um, it's not a, a viable path moving forward. Um, so uh, approximately, you know, I don't have the salary ordinance in front of me. Approximately, how much are we talking annual uh, compensation for one of these positions? I don't know if you guys know that, or if maybe if Kim Kim has a has an answer. Moment. Well, I thought they were going to just hire what number of people. Right. Well, I'm just, just I just want to know what the cost. Right. I just want to know what the cost is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's And for the folks watching at home, this is the council problem solving in action with our sheriff and his team. This is what it looks like. All the sausages made. <laughs> yeah. We, we need to know what it costs for yeah. just the salaries, but we also need to know what the uniform costs and oh. all of yeah. you know, the standards. <clears throat> but we surely have that. Well, I, I guess what, what I'm getting at is that. Um, depending on how these numbers come out, but I mean, I, I think I know how they're going to come out. The the jail tax that we've already established uh, raises about $35,000 a month, uh, which would come pretty close. Uh, it, it, I mean, it fits pretty well. It may, may not be quite enough. It may be a little high, depending on how the numbers come out. But um, that might be an opportunity. Uh, we already have, you know, it, it of course, you need to maintain an operating balance in any fund that has salaries, but we'll essentially already have three months of an operating balance in the jail tax if we size this appropriation to match approximately the, the revenue that's coming in. So that's one thought. The, the, another thought, of course, is the economic development uh, tax, which we've sort of earmarked for paying the bond. Now, that may take some work uh, with bond council because we don't want to make any decision on salaries that would then impair, a bond, uh, impair our bond be, for, yeah. that we're going to need for, uh, to pay for potential jail property and jail mm -hmm. construction. But it just seems like the jail tax that we've already imposed, the small 0 .01 uh, percentage points, would actually, uh, actually almost, is almost exactly the right number, I think. So... And, and there's no reason we couldn't go ahead and budget that right now. Doesn't mean they could spend it right now. Oh, yeah. yes. Molly, have, mm -hmm. do you have this, Molly? It has to be advertised. Right. Yeah, we can't do it today. Right, right. Right, I meant. We can identify some going opportunities. Going I think the number for the salary for a starting correctional officer is $55,062.15. ,015. So if you multiply that by six. And add in, the I'm gonna all add benefits. Yeah, uniform. without benefits, it's like $330,372. Which then comes out to about twenty-seven five monthly. So that fits within, essentially that fits, right? It, was it looks like it was designed just for <laughs> I mean, that. it is about the right. <laughs> yeah. it, but we've been talking about the 425 ought to cover it. Yeah, we've yeah. Been so. That's, that would, I guess that would, I'm saying that would be my recommendation is to, to request an appropriation out of the, uh, the, the jail uh, tax fund for the, for the transition team members. Okay. 
I don't Should know we how start calling it something else because it's not really at the jail tax. It's well, they called the jail lit on the DLGF I don't form, know. so I'm gonna, I don't know. I, let, let's I make mean, sure. corrections, I think. It's, a, it's a community corrections. Nah. Let's make sure our conversations so the community and folks listening can follow. Councillor Iverson. Is it, I, so it, it sounds promising. We've got a, a potential funding stream. I don't have the job descriptions in front of me. Are these positions, permanent positions, or are these positions term limited for the duration of X number of years that a transition might or might not take place? The, the best way to, I can answer that is uh, it's, it's gonna come be in, up in the air a little bit, to be honest with you, be, because remember, we're bringing in entry level corrections positions. So, it, let's take the transition team out of it. Let's say that we had come to you and say, hey, we're really short staffed. We need six new officers in the, in the, to run the jail. That's basically what we're asking you for. The side note is we're pulling six out to be on the transition team. So now, let's, to, to answer your question as succinctly as I can, that over the course of this period of time, you know, I, you know this could be three years, four years, five years, whatever. What we're going to have to do as an agency is part of the transition team is developing a staffing plan, and that depends on whether we co-locate. I mean, there's all kinds of different variables. So as we get to the end of that, we will all know what we were staffed with when we started this process and what we added to this process. And let's say that when we get to the final analysis of it, that at the end of we're getting ready to move into the jail, the staffing plan says, Hey, uh, you only need you only needed three extra people to staff this new jail. So then what we're going to have to do is allow allow three of those individuals to attrition off to get us back to our mm -hmm. our staffing level that we desire. Does it, does that make sense to you? Because there's no way to look out in the future and go, well, we're going to need this many to run this jail. It depends on what we build. So I'm very very comfortable with saying that whoever we bring on this transition team that we will have ample time to either add positions to the new jail staff if needed or decrease jail staff before we do the move in as a result of what we do on this transition team. I, I don't know if I explained that right or not. Does it make sense to you? Yeah, and it's hard to read the tea leaves here. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Uh, but but I, I think that's reassuring to the taxpayers who are being asked to fund something that may or may not have an end date on it. But, and that's okay because, you know, this community, it's been what, 30, 40 years since we built a new jail. So. Hey, I'm going to go back to Councilor McKim. And I'm going to say this is exactly why I'm sugge not suggesting, for example, we just put it in public safety lit or the general fund is because if we kind of segregate these positions a little bit, then at least we can kind of mentally track the, the load and the effort, not only mentally, but fiscally <laughs> track the, uh, the, the load and effort associated with the, with the transition team. But, um, and then just to give the answer to what the actual name is, I'm looking at the statute, it's the tax rate for correctional and rehabilitation facilities. The rubber's going to hit the road here when we finally do the, the manpower study that is required for the new jail. And we'll look at, okay, how many members do we have in, in corrections as a whole? How many did we bring on in the transition team? Is that number higher or lower than that sum total. If it's lower, we're gonna to have to attrition some people off. And that doesn't mean fire them, that means you know people resign. Mm -hmm. And we can, we can see that coming and say, okay, we had one person resign here today, let's just not fill that position. And we'll, we'll build up to that or attrition down to it, however that, that, uh, that manpower allocation study shows us. We can only make decisions based on the information we have. And I think we have a, mm -hmm. <clears throat> A path forward here. That, that future council and sheriff and maybe the, even the existing will have those headaches at a later day, right? Councilor Munson. So I want to remind us all that at various points in, in discussion of staffing for the new facility, uh, there were mentions that uh, fewer staff would be needed than are uh, 
currently employed because it would be uh, designed in a way to make better use of uh, personnel. Do you recall that or am I? I recall it. We're highly skeptical of it. <laughs> I was going to say, you yeah, I agree. Okay, then I'm glad yes. I threw this out here. Did I answer that right, Sheriff? Yes. Yes. Just, just so we don't uh, Here's what we will carry commit. that forward. We commit to this, this body, the taxpayers of this county, that when this new facility uh, is built, we're getting ready to fling open the doors of the new facility, that we, we will have... That, that study conducted and in hand, and we will know very, very closely what it's gonna to take to staff that, and we will not ask this body or the taxpayers of this county for one more position than what that, okay. what that study reveals to us. Okay. Well, it, this wasn't a commitment from, from you all. Uh, I think it was a discussion during the pony training and, and afterwards. Okay. Councilor Crossley. So I just had a quick clarification um, question for you. So I think in your presentation that you just said, you wanna start off at a reasonable size so that you don't have to expand bigger for the transitional team. Did I hear that right? Yes, our, our okay. goal is to, to not over inflate it and have to cut back, but kind of go with a minimal amount. And that's why we're looking at, at uh, DLZ's recommendation of five to eight. Okay. We've kind of settled on six okay. because they give the bullet points of everything we're going to have to cover. So we want to, we want to, I, I guess it's, if you really cut it down, kind of go on the low side instead of the high side, see if we can make it work because we can always come back. This body's been very receptive to us. Uh, but, but we would rather see if we can make it work. And then if we have to come back, we will. But if we don't, then we've made the right decision. If that makes sense. I was just going to say, uh, to Councilor McCam's point, I think before he said it before I could say it, but I was thinking along the lines of the correctional tax, um, such as what we did before for, um, is it the mental health, the contract that we just did um, for the jail. That was kind of my reason of thinking is we could use what we did there for funding for this as well, because obviously ARPA is a term limited and it only lasts us for so long. Um, and so, yeah, so that was a, a question I had. Thank you. Thank you very much. One Any other I, comments from counselors? Yes. One, one thing I'd like to bring up is we're going to be coming to you the next council meeting to talk about those additional positions. So uh, from what I'm hearing is we're going to have to walk a balance here between those new positions that we're asking for um, for the mental health uh, assistance there in jail and these two so I because I think we both kind of had that fun kind of earmark to handle both of them but I got some mm -hmm. I think I've got some really decent news that will help you uh, in that regard but I certainly don't want to uh, belabor that or get into that tonight because it's a little more complex so yeah. we'll make it work. yeah Councillor Hawk yes um, when we discuss this uh, been quite a long time ago now uh, for something that we had hoped to be able to move forward a little quicker. And and people were saying, well, you have to have job descriptions. And no, we already have the job description. And we don't even know which of your entire team is going to be on the transitional team. You'll decide that as you decide how you want this to work. And you don't really even know what you're going to be assigning to them because you're going to be working through this. It isn't like as if you've all done this five or six times. So uh, one of the things that we were told was that if, they, if the ones who are doing the transition might not always be the same people. They may be on the team for a while, back off and somebody else do it, whatever. The, whoever has the best abilities to do the job that you need. Um, and my assumption is, maybe I shouldn't assume this, that if they are doing the regular job and doing the transition portion, they would be making more money at that point, is, or, or not. Or are they going to just be working transition and they're still going to just have the same job description? And the reason why I asked this, I 
think our county attorney said that we couldn't do it in the form of like ha like we would do for special training, which we did la in last year's budget. We did certain things for special training. So I, that's something you can work out to see what, what we legally can do uh, to adjust those salaries up and down. I'll, de I'll defer to Molly a little bit here, but I think in the, in the contract we actually did put a specialty team stipend that when they're on the team, they're, they're getting a little bit more, and then when, if they go back, that's retracted back. Uh, okay, great. So but I think all that been language was then? removed from the contract. I'm sorry? I think that language was removed oh, from the contract. Okay. Um, I can't remember why. I, I don't, I think it's because we weren't here yet, right? Um, but I mean, we could look at amending the contract and seeing if we could um, put it back in there or we can come up with something. I'm not even sure why Why would it even need to be in the contract right. if, it, if it really just, just applies to county staff. Um, because it's a budgetary decision. Because the, the All the other specialty pays are in the contract, so yeah. I think it logically goes in yeah. the contract um, yeah, along we, with the we other over ones. This. But that won't slow us down from... It's not yeah, like she said, it could be amended. No. I mean, okay. It shouldn't slow anything down. Okay, well, do I still have the floor or not? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I mean, I was the interrupting before, so this time I will try it to be better. So, okay. So, point is that we can move forward with the six people or whatever you're talking about because we know we can see the funding is there. It's not going to be a contract. It's going to be regular. We know what the salary is going to be. And then you can work out whatever uh, additional amount it might be for the stipend for the ones who happen to be doing transition at the time. But right now they're not going to be because you don't even have staff to do it. Is that under? Is that correct? Yes, no. I yeah, I believe that to be true. And okay. and to the point that you made about will people be coming off? And, and Corey talked about the team correcting and, and swelling. And, but but not only that, for example, we have we have one officer that is a an expert on the intake process. That's what he does. That's if you've got a question, we ask him. So he would be someone that we would want to utilize when we're developing. The, how the intake area is going to look and what those policies are. But then we have another officer who's, who's really good at technology-based things. So what would happen is one guy would come on, another, as depending on what we're looking at that time, another one would come off. But it doesn't matter because we've got those six positions backfilled. As long as we're not pulling more than six out at any given time, it's right. going to work. Does that make sense? Right, right. Okay. okay. Right. Uh, do you have anyone on staff that is, uh, as you do the intake, to see if that's their fourth time, their tenth time, their fifteenth time? They just, you know, we know that revolving door. I watch the jail bookings. I've got these people's names memorized. <laughs> I look to see when they're going to be right back out the door. Um, but do we have a list of those that that? you know that it's just, they're in and back out, in and back out, and working on ways that we either keep them long enough so they can get some of the changes that you're hoping to make, or we encourage them to live someplace else. <coughs> I'm just saying. Probably getting a little bit above our pay grade, you know, we're the housers, but, uh, you know, one of the things that we're going to talk to you about is just that very thing of what assistance can we provide uh, in the time that they're there, and that'll be on the next meeting agenda. But how long they're there is really absolutely not up to us in any any manner. We uh, we like we tell them, we're not here to judge you. We're here to house you, and that's that's or, and help you while you're here. I, I'm just saying that I believe the public is is concerned and continue to be concerned and that's what we're hearing from the public and that's who we're here to serve that they are really tired of the criminal transients that's causing problems for our community they whatever we can do to either help them or encourage them to go to another community where they 
that behavior is acceptable because it just can't be acceptable here much longer. It, it, it just isn't. So I, I know that's the courts, that's the prosecutor, whatever. But I just want to, I'm Council so Crossley. sorry, I'm so sorry. I, I just, I, I want to rebuttal that last comment because I, I feel like we're not, and correct me, I'm no law expert at all, and I don't think either of us are either, um, but I, I, the what we're facing, and what, you know, what Council Hawk was just singing, that's not immune to just Monroe County. That's that's all over. Yes. That that's everywhere. So I, I think I, I just I, I caution us to be very careful in, in how we're talking and being mindful of how we are talking of, of folks. Whether you know they're whatever we think of them, you know, the whole thing of transient here, there, everywhere. They're here, your job, and you're standing in your lane and trying to figure out what you can do. Um, is all you can do, and it's up for other people to figure out the rest. That is not something that I would think is in your your jurisdiction or in state statute for what you're supposed to do. Okay. For the question at hand, which I think what you presented to us is how might we fund this, I think we've come up with some options, point. and I think the next meeting we're going to get it maybe done. I don't yeah. want to. Well, it sounds like we. You would have to advertise the appropriation, and the okay. deadline for the March meeting has already passed. So the quickest you could get the appropriation advertised and then appropriate it would be April. And I think it's the 9th. So, so if we follow the law on that and we're required to, we could get this addressed at that time. Does that sound like Everybody something? Everybody has to vote in favor. Yeah. So, counselors, uh, I'll throw that to you with that caveat from Councilor Hawk. Am I hearing any objections to that notion? Yes. Councilor well, okay. Count, Councilor Hawk just brought up the the issue of everybody um, having to vote in favor. Is that? I mean, we we could, if that's a concern, um, we could all we could vote on any salary ordinance amendment at the next meeting, and then the appropriate it's the appropriation that we. we that we have a statutory constraint. That's nothing. That's, that's yeah, not yeah. our procedure. We're not dragging our feet. That's the right, law. We could do. Um, we could do it quicker. We, we could do the, the. We could do the salary ordinance. I mean, am, am I wrong? Could we do the salary ordinance mm -hmm. at the next meeting and then do the appropriation right. at the, yes. uh, at the I, April? I'll just have to get with um, Phil and Jordan to complete <clears throat> the uh, application pro or request process. Okay. So I I think we've got some steps and some answers here, Sheriff. Uh, to get this done. And one thing I just want to note, I appreciate the questions and comments from counselors. Here's what I appreciate, appreciate about this, and I think it's different than maybe past discussions we've had. We see incremental steps. We see great things that are happening from the feedback that's coming in. And we see sort of a path forward where we support this effort and kind of figure out what we do to support it. And I like that. And I like the problem solving things, Councilor McKim and others who jumped in on that. I think that that's good and gives us a, some steps moving ahead. Okay. Well, with that, anything else, Sheriff? You no, absolutely. To... Thank you for being understanding and patient with us. This is new territory, and you know we're we're learning as you are as well. But we'll give our word; we'll be transparent. With you, period. You know, and we need you uh, for us to move forward with this. Um, but it's going to be a long journey, so it's going to be baby steps in the beginning, but it's going to move quickly. Um, um, and we do need the support, so so thank you. Thank you so much, Sheriff. And thank you to your entire team. All right, Council, I think that takes us to item number 10. Council Brunson, did you have something? No, we can you sure? handle it okay. later. Okay. And item 10 was we, I don't know if we officially tabled 10 no, and 11. I was going to say, no, you did not. So we, we need to officially a table uh, item 10 A and B. Council, without objection, um, I'd like to table items 10 B and 11 A to, par no, pardon me, just 10 B. 10 uh, A and B. 10 A and 10 B to the March 26th meeting. Is there an objection to that? No. All right, so ordered. Let's move on then to item 11. Council, I move to approve resolution 24-13, a resolution to update the 2022 Sophia Travis Community Service Grant awarded to Beacon Inc. Inc. Second. All right. For this, Ms. Turner King, I think you've got some things. 
This resolution um, codifies a request by Beacon. They received a Sophia Travis grant funding in 2022, but due to some circumstances out of their control, was not able to use the funding within the allotted time by the end of 2023. Um, originally, they were going to use the funding to train staff at Beacon to become CPR instructors. Um, however, the individual who was training their staff to be instructors unfortunately passed away, and so that delayed their timeline. Um, and so they finally have gotten their staff trained as instructors, and what they're requesting is to now utilize the remaining funds that they received to allow the on-staff instructors to provide CPR training to other staff members and to buy um, supplies for that project. So the resolution codifies two requests. It's to extend the purpose of the grant and to extend the timeline for which they can use the funds. Um, this did go to the Sophia Travis Grant Committee and passed uh, unanimously. All right. Any further comments on this from counselors? Councilor Munson. I'll just uh, quickly add that this kind of situation has happened uh, over the years with multiple grant projects. Mm -hmm. Things come up that, yeah, that are unexpected and adjustments need to be made. Councilor Hawk. Uh, yes, uh, so this is actually just like a stipend or something for their existing people uh, to do the training for, and so how many people will a $7,000 be used to spread amongst? because this is like giving them sort of an extra raise for one year, correct? I mean, is this going to be, is, a, is this like covered in, with a contract with them or it, is there, this going there to be? There is a contract and there is a, a very specific proposal that's uh, available on the website uh, for a link to that it's available to see and I, do not have that information on the tip of my fingers. Do you? I don't have information on how many individuals um, they will be providing CPR training to, but from my understanding from the way Beacon presented it at the staff or at the um, Sophia Travis meeting is that this isn't a stipend or a raise for their staff members. This is literally just to have the supplies and provide them the training. Yeah. Oh, oh I'm sorry, it doesn't say supplies. It, I mean, um, it includes supplies, but it is not just supplies. It's not just supplies. It's for CPR first aid training, so it would be the supplies to facilitate that training. Well, then that sounds like somebody's getting some additional money, and I'm wondering, is that two people? Is that five people? I mean, one person? I, I, I think it's a legitimate question, but if you folks don't have a problem with it, just... I think... I think we did not question it at the meeting when we talked about extending uh, the schedule because we had already uh, deliberated over uh, this proposal as well as all the other proposals when we uh, first made our recommendations uh, as a committee to the council. Yeah, one, one thing I just wanna add is the, the, the Sophia Travis Grant Committee has, has <laughs> had these changes or extensions or something has gone wrong. In this case, they've had a death on staff uh, that has changed their ability to implement the program. Um, and given that the, that committee's work vets these, looks at these, I, I used to serve on that. I know the exhaustive scoring system. Councilor mm -hmm. Munson has put together that actually makes it not exhaustive, but very effective in <laughs> spotting all the community needs, all the things that pop up. That committee has been very reliable in sort of serving in a sort of a, a defensive armadillo towards the community need, spotting those, going to those, running towards them, and then adjusting. And I kind of see this as an extension of that. Um, so any further discussion from counselors? Okay, let's do this. Let's go to comments from the public. You can raise your hand on Teams or come forward in the Nat U Hill. Okay, seeing none. On this item, we will go to a roll call vote. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. 
Councillor Iverson. Yes. Councillor Hawk. No. Councillor Deckard. Yes. Councillor Crossley. Yes. Motion passed by majority five to one. If people have questions, I hope they will go to the website and uh, look at the information which is available for them to, to check into this particular grant project. All right. So that takes us now to item B, which um, we have on here, amending the food and beverage tax in Monroe County. My understanding is, uh, Council, you've received an inquiry from the city on this? Yes, I did talk to um, Corporate Council this afternoon, right before the meeting, um, regarding this uh, ordinance change. And um, she would like the opportunity, we would like to have the opportunity to sit down and discuss it further. So I'm asking that you consider tabling this item so that I can discuss um, any implications that this might have for the city with Corporate Council and answer any of their concerns or questions. And we've done that before in that spirit. Council, if there's no objection, I would offer that we table this to March 26. No objection. Hearing no objection, so ordered. Thank you so much. And we appreciate that continued dialogue. That takes us to item C. Council, I move to approve a resolution 2024-12, a resolution establishing pay rates for absentee board members. Second. All right. Thank you very much. And I believe uh, on this, Ms. Turner, can you have some updates since we last talked and looked at this? Correct. So this is um, a resolution that comes to council to clarify some salary ordinance confusion that employee services is having with the paying um, the absentee board members. And statutorily, the council sets the uh, per diem rate for absentee board members. At the last council meeting, um, we council was presented with three options to move forward um, in resolving that confusion. One option was to remove the per election day language that is in the um, salary ordinance and establish $140 per diem regardless of if these individuals are working two hours, six hours, eight hours. Another option or proposed was to establish an hourly rate for these individuals. And then a third option was to just have one category of absentee board members um, at an hourly rate instead of having subcategories, which is currently how the salary ordinance ha um, is set up. I took these options to the election board meeting and they discussed them at their <clears throat> March 7th meeting. Um, and a majority of the election board had expressed three preferences. The first preference was that uh, an hourly rate be used over a per diem. The second preference was that subcategories continue to be used. And then the third preference was that there was a differentiation in pay between the subcategories. So taking that information, I drafted a resolution for council consideration. And this resolution, um, I think, satisfies the election board's preference, but also on the same hand, makes our salary ordinance somewhat simpler and um, would eliminate confusion. So what the resolution does would establish three categories of absentee board workers. So absentee C, B, and A. And then each category, C, B, and A, would have a different pay rate. Then the election, it would be up to the election board to take all their subcategories, so their absentee leads, their absentee recruiters, their absentee clerks, and put them in one of those categories, C, B, and A. And then they, once placed in that category, the individuals who fulfill those positions would be paid accordingly. I did use an hourly rate to reflect um, the preference of the election board, but those numbers are just based off basically what we have right now. So if council wants to consider changing them, I'm happy to edit the resolution. Thank you very much, Mr. King. Councilor McKim. Thank you very much. And um, I, I, I also watched the uh, election board meeting after the fact. And uh, <laughs> yeah, the, pre the preference from the majority of the election board was clear that uh, an hourly uh, rate would be much more appropriate than a per diem. In fact, I think it was even said that a lot of, a lot of these folks don't, 
you know, specifically work fewer than eight hours a day. Um, I do, so I, I like the idea of the three categories. Um, I think that provides them a, enough uh, differentiation. I, I think I would like to, I guess, maybe see a little bit more difference in the hourly rates, and I would definitely like to increase them a little bit, in, in particular the absentee worker C, which is, uh, so it looks like the, the draft that, we, that was in the published packet has $17 an hour for, for A, Seventeen fifty for B, and eighteen dollars for C. Is that is that what you're seeing? Um, <clears throat> you know, I think I would like to see C, which we can think of as leads. Uh, I would think uh, I, I would like to see C be more like twenty dollars an hour, uh, and maybe B eighteen fifty, hmm. and maybe leave A as as seventeen, something like that. Is that a motion? Uh, I, I can. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll make that. I'll make that motion. I'll second. Yes. Okay. And a motion and a second to amend the resolution to okay. the amounts of 17, uh, A will stay same, Set, the option for B, A will stay the same, B shall be from 715 up to 1850, C will be from $18 to $20 an hour. Yes. There we go. Just discussion on that mm, amendment we have before us. Any discussion from counselors? I'm not seeing much. Do they either love it or maybe they don't? I don't know. Uh, Councilor Iverson. So I, I will uh, let me take this opportunity to say that I, I, I love the idea that the election board looked at this. I really like the idea that there's a lot of collaboration on this. And I think moving the dollar amounts up <clears throat> is going to help not only attract uh, additional staff, but also is going to help retain folks in this really important area. So I, I'm in favor of this. I'll add in just some comments here. I, um, I know that this has been a desire to get this more specific um, in a lot of different portions, and I won't tick through all those. And I appreciate the effort to get something that the council can bite their teeth into to support, much like we were talking about the jail, to support the function, because gosh knows we're not in there doing this, um, but also that gives clarity to how we account for this, how we manage it. Etc. And one last comment I'll just generally make, because it should always go without saying, but, but it needs to be said, we appreciate our absentee workers who make free and fair elections possible and make the process by which we either set up here or get results to tell us who will. Um, and that's an important thing. Any, any other discussion from counselors? We've got an amendment. Let's vote on the amendment. Who, who seconded the Councilor amendment? Councilor Hawk. Oh. Thank you. So let's actually, we need, I need, con, do I take public comment on an uh, amendment on this? You don't have to. I mean, I, I, I yeah. yeah. We're, we will do comment on the underlying uh, resolution. So with that, let's do a roll call on the amendment. You can do a voice vote on the amendment. Okay. Yes. All those in favor, signify by saying aye to the amendment. Aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, I heard a amendment that's passed. Now we're back to the underlying resolution and I'll ask uh, counselors for comments here. Thank you to uh, Ms. Turner King uh, for working and thank you to the clerk and the other members of the election board for providing their, uh, their input. Yeah, it's very fruitful problem solving. Let's see if the public's got any comments on this. If you're here in the Natu Hill, you can come forward, or those uh, via Teams, you can raise your hand, and we will hear from you. And again, this is on the underlying resolution as amended by Councilor McKim's adopted change, seconded by Councilor Hawk. I am seeing no hands. Oh, question. So we will move to a roll call vote. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Councilor Deckard? Yes. Councilor Munson? Yes. Councilor Crossley? Yes. yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. yes. Motion passed unanimous. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate everyone's efforts to get that done. Let's move on now to item 12. Council, I move to approve the request 
for an additional appropriation and fund 8171-0000 by Centennial Pathway in the amount of $82,095.88 in the services category. Second. Uh, Ms. Gregory, I've got this from you. Yeah, this is just a housekeeping item to appropriate um, the anticipated um, reimbursements for the remainder of um, the eligible expenses to be reimbursed for this um, Bicentennial Pathway Grant Fund. So um, we're just requesting that this amount to be appropriated. Anything that wouldn't get reimbursed for any reason will then be corrected out of this fund. Thank you. Questions or comments from council? I'm not seeing any. We will go to comments from the public. Raise your hand on teams or come forward in the Nat U Hill. Seeing none, we can go to a roll call vote. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Crossley? Yes. Councillor Decker? Yes. Motion passed? Yes. Okay. That takes us to item number 13 from the Highway Department. Council, I move to approve the highway's request to approve the traffic control technician slash laborer job description and to simultaneously amend the salary ordinance and fund 1176-0000 motor vehicle highway to inactivate account lines 15804 mechanic and 15846 truck driver and to add account lines 15861 and 15862 traffic control technician slash laborer 40 hours LTC Highway A non-exempt. Second. All right, we've got a motion and a second. <clears throat> and this, uh, Michelle. Hi. Um, as you know, Lisa's at a, a conference, so she asked me to do this for her. So um, her request for a traffic control technician slash laborer went to PAC. Um, it came back uh, from WIS at, a L at an LTC A which um, highway has their own grid, so it's an LTC Highway A. Um, and she's wanting to remove uh, the one mechanic and one truck driver and replace it with these, with two positions of the technician control laborer. So um, um, this item did not go back to PAC um, at March for the review, uh, that meeting was canceled. So it, uh, she asked for it to come to the entire council so that she can move forward with getting these positions rather than having to wait till April. So. We agreed to expedite that. So counselors, if you'll indulge this, pinch hitting for PAC, who's also incidentally here. <laughs> Any discussion on this? All. all right, the silence means it's golden. Uh, let's see if the public's got any comments. Raise your hand on Teams or come forward the Nat U Hill. Seeing none, we'll go to a roll call vote. Councilor Deckard? Yes. Councilor Munson? Yes. Councilor Crossley? Yes. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Thank you very much. For item 14, uh, Council, this is a discussion about consent agenda items. And specifically, I've heard the plea from several of you, and I look at the clock, it says it's seven to eight, uh, that we need a consent agenda policy so that we have less items on our docket that may not need the uh, piece by piece. And so what I'm, I'm, I'm completely open to anything that makes these meetings more efficient and, and keeps the transparency to our public. And so what I would like to do is to offer to you now to sound out, here are things I would support generally to be on consent agenda items so that we're all on the same page when we go to such a policy if we choose to do so. And so, Councilor McKim. First of all, thank you very much for bringing this up. I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about, uh, discuss it. I guess the three things that came to mind, and I'm sure I'm missing something, uh, but three things that came to mind were intercategory inter transfers, uh, new budget lines, and position descriptions without a classification impact, um, several of which we've had 
tonight. Mm -hmm. um, not, not, not the tonight meeting really dragged on. There, we actually did lots of mm -hmm. substantive work tonight. But there are some times where we just have a lot of these items. So that's my thought. Thank you, Councilor McKinn. Councilor Munson. I would add to that uh, minutes because I have never known this council to vote against <laughs> approval of any set of minutes. <laughs> well, I just said last week, last time, I had them change it. Oh, good. Well, I think but you that, still. That's a, if but you, you want, if you it. want a change, then you just bring that up and mm -hmm. that handled as part of the business of the meeting. Good point. Thank you. And the, the same goes with those positions or intercategory transfers or any any of those um, topics. Councilor Hawk. Um, so what I'm wondering is if what we would do, I'm just trying to think how logistics work. All of the transfers, we could just read them all up all of the transfers at one time so that you're not like having somebody set out there through two hours just to do a transfer. Because remember, they can do an in-house transfer as long as it's in the same category. They don't have to come to us. Right. It's when they take it to a different category. Then they have to come to us. But, you know, if we, if we study it and we you read it off, you still would have to read, you're going to transfer it from here to here. The whole thing has to be read off so the public knows what you're doing. And if there's five of them, five different departments, you could just read them all off. And we vote on it in one fell swoop. Or if any council member wanted to pull something out and vote on it separately, you could do that. Is that how you are visualizing this? That's the way I, I mean, I, I would, I would include all. So basically what you do is you have a consent agenda that from what we talked about so far would include intercategory transfers, new budget line creations, uh, the position, to, and my, my suggestion is position descriptions with no classification change. And then Councillor Munson suggested minutes. All those would be in the consent agenda. Any councillor could pull any one of those out right, if they right. wanted to. Or otherwise, we just vote on the whole thing at, at Right, once. and then if you look at the minutes in some of the, I don't know if you ever go on and read the minutes from other communities. It's very enlightening. They're, they're in and out of there in an hour's time. And I'm talking about big things going on in Hamilton County, and they're in and out of there in an hour's time. So uh, I, I'm not saying we would ever do that, because I understand, sure. but I think there's ways that we can do it that makes a lot more sense for our staff, for the departments, and for the community at large, because a lot of times, they want to hear what's going on, but they don't want to hear us talking about some of the things that will take forever to get through. Do you want to add something, Councilor? I want to add something, um, just so that everybody understands. The basic information that we see in our uh, agendas and in the packet would still be there. We would just be taking a vote to accept uh, the combined. consent agenda or to pull out uh, uh, particular portions of it uh, for direct action by the council. It would literally be an item in which we would say we would have the consent agenda, we would vote on literally the consent agenda, and it would be all those things. Those things. And I would know incumbent on counselors to Look at that. If there's something you don't want, yep. you're going to have to articulate that right. on your own. Councilor Hawk. I, I know we tried this before because I pushed hard to get this done before. Uh, and there was some kind of pushback. Oh, well, I think the departments wanted some of them, maybe wanted to be here. I don't know. I think that we'll try it. And why not? Why not? Councilor McKenna. <laughs> Well, well, and on the department heads wanting it, we, we've now that we've kind of taken up the practice of having a departmental updates, they have an opportunity if they want to right, make a particular really, presentation right. to the council. I think departments want us to move forward so they're not sitting out there for two hours so that they can get a yes on like a highway thing that we all know we're going to say yes. Maybe some of the ones where we know it's a slam dunk, get those first, get them in and out of here. 
I do. I want to ask Michelle because she ultimately have to manage this. What are your? Do you have any thoughts, questions, suggestions? So, um, so am I looking at having two different agendas? So there would be, well, I meant like, so at the beginning there will be like a consent agenda, and then everything else will follow. Um, will the um, department heads need to be here? if they're listed on the consent agenda. And what I'm thinking is if we put them on the consent agenda, we send out a draft. And if they say, yes, I wanna speak or whatever, we can you know, move things. But you know, if it's on the consent agenda, do they necessarily need to be here? I just wanna... Well, that just takes yeah. forever. Yeah, yeah, I don't think we, we wanna mm -hmm. waste their time. Right. I think it has, it's incumbent on us to be courteous enough to if we have a concern with one yes. of their items, to let them know in advance, but ask yeah. them questions, try to resolve things in advance uh, as much as possible. Okay, yeah, right. right. I just so wanna make sure why. in case somebody asks, you know, that is, mm -hmm. yeah. right, because you you don't, I mean, it isn't that you're not gonna take public comment, we're not gonna take public comment on every one of those. Individually, right. We would literally sense. say, we will now on the consent agenda, anyone, counselors have any comments, objections? Does the public have a comment on it? And as I believe they do in other bodies, Mr. Askins is gonna be the expert. The public will sometimes say, uh, that transfer, I'm not sure about that. And then we will either right. heed it or not, and down the road we go. Did we don't I think summarize they that, that right? <laughs> they don't need that new budget line, do they? They don't. <laughs> they have thoughts, but they may not. It's always the minutes. Um, my other question is, so let's say uh, highway department has one consent agenda item and the other one is an additionals. Do, so we'll just put that one on there and then additionals will come later. Counselors. Okay. Yes. Yep. Yes. yes. All right. Yep. I'm just trying to make sure I, I get this right. So. Whack off as much of our agenda as we can without okay. impairing the ability to deliberate <laughs> on substantive issues. Okay. And, and I mean, one thing goal. I will just know, I am highly cognizant when we are doing our meeting, the people that are sitting in those chairs who have just run a department all day, yes. whether they're elected or appointed or they got stuck with it, I, I am cognizant of that. I hope this helps this. I'm going to ask counselors. Uh, as we develop, I think, a resolution to do this or whatever you need to do it, um, that we be in the spirit of being mindful about this because I have noticed that our meetings, uh, they have drifted up on time. Now, look, we're tackling jail and convention center and all sorts of good things, but they're ticking up on time. So we all need to be in a, a mindful spirit about it. With that, I'll stop talking. Do you need anything else from me, us on this? You're solid? Awesome. Well, that's progress for the day. Uh, that takes us, I believe, to the, well, ironically, the minutes. <laughs> so, Councilor Crossley, do you have any motions? Council, I move to approve the summary minutes for the February 27th, 2024 executive session of the Monroe County Council and the Board of Commissioners as presented. Second. With any luck, that's the last time you'll hear her do a minutes motion. We, we'll, see. <laughs> we'll see. We will see. We will see. When I first came on the council, minutes were a, a forty-minute discussion on several meetings. So we're as progress. Uh -huh. All right. Any public comment on the minutes? Raise your hand. Come forward. The Nat U Hill. <laughs> Seeing none, we will do a roll call vote. Voice vote. Voice we can vote. Do voice. Could do mm -hmm. it. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? We carried that. We'll now go to our final, final item, and that's council comments. Any councilors' comments? Okay, sounds like I we... Can yes, go I ahead. Thought, I was waiting on something. Uh, yes, I just want to comment um, about some concerns, and I, you know, you don't have to, any of you have to agree with me, but I get... To, have my own pen. A dear friend of mine uh, on Facebook showed pictures where he had been shot. He was just on his bicycle going down on the Bayline Trail, and somebody decided to start shooting him with a BB gun. Um, and he said he was very grateful that it didn't hit one, didn't hit his eye or something. And then people were saying, but there's 
all of the encampments along the Beeline Trail. Now, I'm just telling you, I think the community has had it. And when I read that about my friend, I thought it is time for someone to start speaking up. I think we're all afraid to open our mouths. How many of us really want to walk down the Beeline Trail and people be shooting at you with a BB gun? So this is not who we are. We're a welcoming community that welcomes everyone who wants to be a good citizen. But for these people who think it's a good idea to sit there with a BB gun and shoot a perfectly harmless individual going down the way on his bike, it's not acceptable. It's time for us to step up and say we're tired of it, we've had enough, and let's return to safe and civil as we once were. Thank you very much, Councilor Hawk. I, I do have an added note. Um, to just kind of throw in, I, I did a meeting, uh, I sometimes traipse around in different people's districts, uh, and I was in with the Broadview Neighborhood Association, which I believe is Councilor Crossley's district. I was meeting with them along with uh, uh, one of Judge Stafford. And one of the things they indicated around their community area uh, in that vein is they would like to see the county be a little bit more proactive in helping collect things that are left behind in the community, particularly around county property or non-city property. And so uh, we can follow up certainly with the commissioners to see uh, options to do that, uh, to keep areas getting all the resources that they need uh, as we see fit. All right, any other comments? Thank you very much everyone for your work. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>